Studies. We're happy to have you here with us for the public seminar on decentralization, health, and governance, which will be discussed by our, our experts here at PIDS. But before we give the floor to our speakers, may I call on PIDS President Dr. Celia Reyes for her opening remarks. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, today's activity is um, something that's uh, very interesting. Um, we actually are featuring four PIDS studies that have been conducted by three of our uh, research fellows. Um, much has been said about the impacts of decentralization and um, on the economy, politics, as well as governance. So I think it's high time that we feature um, the work that were done last last year, um, but which we have not actually um, disseminated in a public forum like this yet. Uh, since the enactment of the Local Government Code in 1991, how have local governments been performing? Has it improved the delivery of public services? Um, we hope so. Our first speaker this afternoon, um, Dr. Justin Jokno Sikat, will show us the findings of her study which reviewed existing literature on Philippine decentralization, particularly on local government's performance and development. Uh, she will also be looking at um, one of the more important sectors, the health sector, and how decentralization has affected the delivery of healthcare services in the country. As we all know, the local government code also mandated the devolution of some of the healthcare services in the Philippines. Um, but Justine, our Dr. Jokno Sikat, will actually uh, examine whether it has really improved efficiency or whether our policies need to be reviewed. Um, we're also very pleased that one of our um, research associates, um, Janet Cuenca, will be presenting um, her study titled Health Devolution in the Philippines, which talks about the country's experience in health devolution, including the lessons that can be applied for uh, policy making. And um, finally, um, talks on decentralization will not be complete without um, looking at the fiscal aspects. And so Dr. Michael Abrigo, one of our senior research fellows um, will present his study on how demand for healthcare services is influenced by our local government incomes. And his focus will be on antenatal care. Um, as always, we hope that um, this will provide um, useful inputs in current debate on, on decentralization, health and governance, and we're looking forward to uh, fruitful discussion with all of you. Again, good afternoon. Thank you so much, Dr. Reyes. Let me give you a little bit of a background our, about our first speaker. She is an assistant professor at the Virata School of Business at the University of the Philippines. She is on secondment as a research fellow here at the PIDS. She has a PhD in business administration, is a PhD economics candidate, has two ma master's degrees, one in economics and the other one in management. Most of her academic and professional experiences were focused on public sector economics and economic policy. While at the Department of Budget and Management, she worked on reforms to enhance trans transparency in budget operations and other fiscal policy, focusing on regional and higher education concerns. She teaches courses on fiscal and monetary policy, public sector and development economics. She also does research in the areas of public expenditures, public financial management, political economy, and institutions at both national and local governments level for both local and international organizations. She is currently uh, a board member of the Philippine Economic Society. Friends, I give you Dr. Charlotte Justin Sikat. Good afternoon.
showed that there was slow regional income convergence and that infant mortality rates and local road densities are varied across regions. In addition, it has also been observed that there is sluggish progress in human development across provinces. Now, this just shows you a picture. Um, there's none, I don't, we were trying to look for more updated data, but this shows you regional infant mortality rates comparing 1992 and 2006. It's by region, so on the horizontal axis, you'll see regions. And as you can see, the lighter line is, are the figures for 1992. Um, and the, the darker column would be the figures for 2006. There were considerable improvements, as you can see. So infant mortality rates went down. However, it still varied across the regions. Now, in addition, another policy issue would be varied fiscal performance. Um, varied fiscal performance could also be one of the reasons why there is varied service delivery across LGUs, especially for poor LGUs who have difficulty providing um, basic services to their constituents. What are the observations in terms of fiscal performance? Well, overall, locally raised revenues as a proportion of LGU income remains considerably low. I'll show you a graph in a bit. It's about 30% only of LGU income that uh, local government units raise for themselves. They are largely dependent on intergovernmental fiscal transfers, uh, average of 70%. Okay? Now, in addition to that, local governments allocate most of their budget to the cost of administering government, cost of administration. That's about 50%. I also have a slide to show that to you later on. So this would show you the distribution of local and external sources of income of LGU. So you have to, I'm sure it's familiar to you, um, LGU income are generally from two sources, internal sources, which is raised locally by the LGU. This would be non-tax or tax. Um, revenues. The main proportion would be from real property taxes. That's the main bulk of the sources of revenues of LGUs locally raised. But the external sources would be the intergovernmental fiscal grant I mentioned earlier, which we all know as ERA. Um, there are also shares from national wealth as well and um, some other transfers, intergovernmental transfers, but um, the bulk is really from external sources. And this average is about 69%. Okay, so LGUs this is for all LGUs, prov uh, provinces, cities, and municipalities. Of course, by the level of, uh, of uh, uh, LGU, this might differ. Um, for provinces, in my study before, it was about 90%. Okay, 90% dependent on external sources. So this just gives you a picture of that. Um, in terms of expenditure uh, sectoral priorities, Okay, uh, apologies for the very small font. There are general public services, social services, economic services, capital investment, which includes capital outlay, infrastructure spending, as well as debt servicing. And the red line on top is the uh, allocation on average for general public services from 2006, uh, 2009 to 2016. So what this just shows is that most of the expenditures of local governments go to you know, operating government. Um, social services, which would include health, um, labor, that would be the second, that would have the second largest share, which is the, I'm sorry, I can't point to the, this one. This would be social services, okay, and below that would be economic services and capital outlay. This is for debt servicing, it's very, very small. It's a very small proportion of, of uh, LGU expenditures. Now, this just shows you, again, this is pretty dated. This is 2011, but it's the best we could do. It's a regional density of local roads per region. So what this shows you is the kilometer of local roads per square kilometer of land in the region. Okay, so this is in the region. So the, the one here with the, high, with the tallest column is for the NCR, of course. Uh, we have a small land area, and then there are a lot of roads. Uh, um, the lowest would be, well, ARM and Bimaropa. Okay, so that's the lowest density. That's in 2011. Okay. Now, what are the possible explanations that's available out there? Well, firstly, varied development might suggest um, two things. Uh, the inability of some LGUs to deliver basic services, okay. whether it be for fiscal reasons, they don't have enough funds, or they're not planning properly, or for political reasons. Um, 
the, the local chief executive might have different preferences or priorities. Um, or secondly, um, going back to economic theory again, differences in local preferences might also explain varied development. So if we believe that the local chief executive is sensitive to what his voters want, and his voters want a certain thing. Later on, I'll show you uh, one of my previous studies uh, that voters in provinces on, on average preferred transfers, social welfare spending from their local governments. So it also could reflect that, uh, because transfers are direct benefits to the voters uh, rather than mm, really to development overall, like infrastructure and all that. But we'll see that later on. I'm already jumping ahead. Now, how does the literature explain uh, uneven LGU development, and is there empirical evidence on this? So really, I'm just doing a survey of the existing literature, and we will see that there are a lot of um, fiscal explanations and political economy explanations, but the empirical evidence, statistical, uh, you know, it's very, very sparse. Okay, uh, a fellow here also, see Dr. Manassan, she's really written a lot about centralization. So, so most of my um, most of the literature cites her. So here we go. What are the fiscal explanations out there? Well, divergent fiscal capacities across LGUs contribute to divergent development outcomes. If you don't have enough funds or you're not planning properly or you're not implementing properly or monitoring, you would have varied uh, development and therefore development outcomes. Okay. Now, the, um, some would also argue that the era formula does not consider disparities in revenue raising capacity of LGUs. So what, what this strand of literature explains is that uh, there are some LGUs who really cannot raise their own revenues. So they should be given, um, or the formula should be adjusted to recognize that some can, some cannot. Um, so that's what this um, strand of literature would suggest. And also, some would argue that there's a mismatch in the expenditure responsibilities devolved to the different levels of LGUs, like perhaps local roads uh, that that cross boundaries should be, you know, joint or at the provincial level. And so this is what that strand of literature is. So, so there has been a lot of this. And there are many bills in Congress that try to review the local government code of the Philippines, but never quite um, saw like. Okay. Now, what are the political explanations of varied um, LGU development? Well, we'll discuss two, no? a political science and political economy, but they really overlap. So political science literature suggests that the presence of clientelism, or this is patronage, okay, weak states and oligarchies, okay, and coercion such as bossism and vote buying contribute and impact the design of policy and therefore consequently the, the local government outcomes, development outcomes. At the same time, political economy offers that entrenched politicians and political dynasties also do impact the design of policy. So they are all actually quite interrelated. So what's the story behind this? The, if you look at the history, so the, the paper has a bit of a review of history and it's, it showed that um, the political science literature identifies patronage to be in our roots of share crop uh, tenancy arrangement. The, the landowner would be the patron, where the client would be the tenant. And um, the client tills the land and um, gets economic favors from the patron, the landowner, instead. So that is where some of the literature cites clientelism. So that, that um, relationship, that dynamic, was, has been evolved in, to a different level now. That's how the literature would explain that. So that also explains the weak state. When you say weak state, um, and the presence of oligarchies. It would be the land-owning elite who uh, control, support the uh, elected officials or are able to design policy in their own benefit. So that's how the political science literature would explain this. I don't even want to delve in that. That's not my field of expertise. I'm just reporting it <laughs> as, as I reviewed it. Um, coercion, such as bossism, this is the electoral-related violence and vote buying. These also impact um, the, the LGU outcomes, according to the political science literature. So we tried to look at empirical evidence, okay, that tested these um, theories. So there's very s scant, sparse empirical evidence. Um, this one deals with local development outcomes, such as I income growth and um, poverty. So there was inconclusive evidence on the effect of political dynasties on provincial income growth. 
Uh, initially in 2004, there was some relationship found, but when it was revisited and a longer um, time period was examined, uh, the, the results were really mixed. So it's really hard to say for certain. Um, more recently, Mendoza et al. from the Ateneo School of Government, Ateneo School of Government, yeah, found that political dynasties okay, in Luzon neither exacerbate nor reduce poverty, but they do exert a significant and positive influence on poverty in the Visayas and Mindanao regions. So um, these were their findings. Now, on sparse empirical evidence, political economy. So these were discussion papers from, I, th I gathered this from World Bank. Um, uh, with regards to vote buying, Kemani in 2011 found that the vote buying was significantly systematically and robustly related to both lower quality and availability of public health services in the, her particular area of study. So she did a survey, she really went down to the ground. Uh, I can't recall which area that is now, but, but just for that. So there's some evidence there of the negative effect uh, of that, although of course, it's really difficult to say 100% that that's the reason, okay? Um, with respect to voter turnout, more recently, um, Cruz, Labon, and Caribbean in 2017 found that candidates for public office are disproportionately drawn from more central families. What do central families, how is it defined? What does it mean? Central families in terms of accessibilities of voters to the political dynasty candidate member. So if you have a political dynasty candidate, okay, and if this family has easy access, to that political dynasty candidate, then that's considered a central family. And he found that, um, that when the political dynasty candidate is looking for, uh, uh, how do you say this, his, those to run with him, he goes to the different localities and looks for a central fami family that's popular, let's say in the barangays, okay? And if, if they are central, then you will get them. That's why it's disproportionately drawn from more central families. And they also found that family network centrality contributes to higher voter shares, vote shares during the elections. So the pull of these central families uh, would possibly be what explains the higher voter shares, vote shares. So that's them. Um, Carabin and Labon again also had another study in 2017. Um, about dynastic women, okay? So Labon, Parsa, and Carabin show that in the Philippines, binding term limits, so this means that if you're on your last term or your third term, okay? Binding term limits constitute critical junctures in which dynastic women are 240% more likely to access public office. So, ano ibig sabihin ito? What this means is that if you are a dynasty, uh, incumbent dynasty seated elected official and you're on your third term and you're male, chances are, okay, the one who would access or follow you would be the woman in your family. So that's what they found. I also, uh, excuse me, I don't remember the exact sample that they used for this, but um, that's what they found as well. Now for political economy still, okay, there's sparse empirical evidence. A study found that there is higher economic service spending by incumbent governors who are members of political clans, especially when faced with rival clans. So the, the shares that I showed you earlier, the expenditure shares, do they, do they spend more on general public services, social services, economic services? This is what is, it's referring to. These, th this is what was tested. The presence of an incumbent um, dynasty member uh, who, and then the presence of there being a rival clan or not in that particular locality. So that's what was found here. Now, um, the story I was sharing with you earlier um, looked at voter preferences and the expenditure shares of local government. So it's really actually trying to examine um, the characteristics of a voter and how it's related to expenditures. And the particular voter I was interested in was the median income voter. Okay, the median income voter. This is the voter with median income in provinces. And what I found for 2000 and 2003, it's really hard to, well, at the time I was writing it, it was hard to get data. 
So voters robustly prefer social welfare spending. Okay, social welfare spending is under social services, which are mostly for redistributive rather than for development purposes because the benefits would go directly to the person rather than investment in um, physical or uh, infrastructure. Um, still in that study, um, I also examined another political economy model and found that political terms have an effect on the spending priorities of incumbent political dynasty members. Okay, so what did I find exactly? So I looked at two kinds, those who are lame duck or end term, third termer uh, governors, and whether or not they were members of a political dynasty. And what I found is that if you are a member of a political dynasty on your third term, you would spend more on transfers, education, more, th more items that are really private in nature, that the voter directly receives, labor and employment, so it's directly. If you are not a member of a political dynasty but on your third term, it, the data showed that they spend more on infrastructure or general public services, economic services, something not directly identifiable to a voter. So, so there. Now, we were curious, okay, because there are a lot of stories that um, LGUs are bogged down by the many mandates that they have to spend on, like gender, uh, DRR, and then local development. So, in the literature, there is, there has been actually for decades, what you call the decentralization index, and uh, we experimented and estimated it for this particular study. Now, the decentralization index by Ballenberg, uh, Maurice, yeah, just last year it was published, republished, uh, he brought it up again. It measures the empowerment of local populations through the empowerment of their elected officials. And how is that done? Well, it's computed based on the proportion of local government expenditures that the local chief executive has discretion over. So what we did was, we looked at local government expenditures and removed the mandated spending, like the 5% on DRR, disaster risk reduction, or the, the, GAD, the gender, the, the required 5%, or the 20% local development fund. Whatever was left over, that's, what we, that's what we, how we defined what was discretionary to the uh, local chief executive. And we use this formula. Uh, we can discuss this offline if you want, but LE here means, uh, uh, local government expenditures, while CE means central government expenditures. So it's as a proportion of um, to national government expenditures. And what, what I'd like to highlight here is the alpha. Okay? The alpha here that we estimated is the percentage share of subnational government expenditures over which subnational governments have discretion. Okay? And what the results show is that, I'm sorry, I'll go back to that slide in a bit. So this is the decentralization index. It is in the third column. Okay, and it's from 2009 to 2016. Okay, and the alpha is in the second column. It's here. So this is your alpha. This is an average of 72 percent, meaning that the local government official has 72 percent discretion over local government expenditures, as we had estimated this. Which means that they have pretty much leeway uh, to design um, policy, uh, which would also consequently affect development. typical definition of decentralization, which would just be how much do local governments spend compared to the national government spending. Union typical. It's, that's what we normally look at. If you look at the Bureau of Local Government Finance data or you know, any reports, that's what that typically would be. So, so what we found was that compared to the share of LGU to national government expenditures, which is in the last column, that's 18%, uh, 16%, it averages 18.2%. The decentralization index we had estimated is smaller, but they follow the similar trend. Okay, what is their trend? Well, they have been decreasing uh, lately. Okay, why? Well, I was, I'm not, I can't really answer that <laughs> with 100% confidence. My impression is perhaps also because the national government is spending a lot right now. So the denominator is larger. But in any case, what I want to highlight here again is that really uh, local policymakers have 
much discussion over um, expenditures. Okay, so what are the general observations? Well, clearly more research needs to be done, okay, to understand varied local government performance in the Philippines. There's very, very limited research out there, evidence. Now, despite the sparse empirical evidence, policymakers play a crucial role in local government performance and development. The estimated decentralization index highlighted an approximation of the proportion of discretionary local government expenditures that local policymakers are accountable for. Okay. Now, finally, explanations, and this I find very interesting also, explanations of varied fiscal capacity and evidence that some voters prefer goods and services that they receive directly, such as transfers, appears to suggest the role of poverty and income inequality in shaping development outcomes across LGUs. So we also have to address the poverty. In the study that I mentioned, the median income voter is near poor, which is why perhaps he prefers transfers. So it's not just local governments that should do that. It should be a whole of government uh, approach to address that also, because if that's what they're asking for, then, and that's what they're given, then we need to also help um, the whole of government. So this aspect is critical in determining ways to move forward in both research and policy. Okay. Thank you. I have one more. <laughs> so, where's the presentation? So my other hat, <laughs> which is on social protection. So this one, again, actually this is something that uh, Alma and I did back in 2013 for the World Bank. They like to do a lot of public expenditure reviews, so I'm just updating it. Um, and also the World Bank last year recently ish, uh, issued also a social protection uh, review, although they were more focused on certain uh, programs. I'm going to be giving you an overview of what social protection programs are in the Philippines. Now, the importance of social protection and the public expenditure review one of the main economic justifications for social protection is to redistribute income or for equity. Um, I have a couple of former students here. I saw them and I always lecture this. Um, there are efficiency grounds to justify government intervention, but for social protection, it's largely for equity, to help the poor, those who cannot help themselves. That's why social protection is provided. Now, in a developing country such as the Philippines, a comprehensive and well-designed program, social protection system is needed. Now, this public expenditure review gives an overall view of the Philippine social protection system and surveys existing national government social protection programs. Uh, it also ha answers the question of how much has the Philippine government invested in social protection programs this past decade. So I'm just looking for this past decade. Um, now, this is just to show you Philippine poverty incidence. Um, this is based on the FI survey, and this is household poverty in incidence. And it shows that it has been declining uh, since 2006. Uh, does this seem correct, Toots? <laughs> okay, <laughs> there. So, um, how do we, before we even discuss this, I think it's important to define social protection. This is how social protection is defined here in uh, the Philippines. This was adopted in 2007. So there are four general kinds, okay? Uh, for those of you on the side, there's also a screen there. We have labor, mo labor market policies and income support to unemployed, which is defined as government measures that enhance employment opportunities in the country and advance Filipino workers' rights and welfare. Examples of these are SPES, Special e Employment Program for Students, and the Assistance to Displaced Workers, DOLE AMP, um, although now this has been consolidated under the Kabuhayan Program of um, DOLE, uh, Department of Labor and Employment. The second type of social protection would be social welfare programs. These have more long-term effects and more long-term in nature. These are preventive and developmental interventions that seek to support the minimum basic requirements of the poor and reduce risks associated with unemployment, resettlement, marginalization, illness and disability, old age and loss of family care. Okay, an example of this would be conditional cash transfers such as the four piece. Uh, the third type of social protection are social safety nets. 
Okay, ito yung short-term response, yung may emergency urgent agad-agad. So mesh, these are measures that target affected groups with the specific objective of providing relief and um, transition. Okay, and an example of this would be social pension for indigent senior citizens or the SOC pen. And then we also have social insurance. Okay, social insurance would be programs that seek to mitigate income risks by pooling resources and spreading risks across time and income classes. Okay, so this would be the GSIS emergency loans, SSS emergency loans. Now the, f the last column there shows the source of financing because this is actually a public expenditure review. So we should really ideally just include um, those programs that receive budgetary assistance. But the manner by which this was defined by the um, socioeconomic um, committee at NADA was that they wanted to include the some social insurance and some NFA assistance also by the national government. So the fourth column there shows the source of financing. For the first three types of social protection, labor market, social welfare, and social safety nets, these are non-contributory and it's from the national government budget. Okay. However, for the social insurance, it's contributory. It dip, it's conditional on your being a member of the GSIS. You can only take out the GSIS loan, of course, if you are a member of good standing. Okay, who's updated? Now, a bit of a background. In 2007, the Philippines adopted the following definition of social protection. It constitutes programs and policies that seek to reduce poverty and vulnerability to risks and enhance the social status and rights of the marginalized by promoting and protecting livelihood and employment protecting against hazards and sudden loss of income, and improving people's capacity to manage risks. This is how we define social protection. And subsequently, the Philippine Social Protection Operational Framework and implement Implementation Strategy was adopted. So before this, the social protection system in the Philippines was rather fragmented. Um, different um, agencies would have their own programs. Uh, after this, it became more relatively more coordinated. So this is just, it's, this matrix just shows what we include in the expenditures. Because we were looking, our source is from the um, Department of Budget and Management. We use the expenditure data there. That's why it's an expenditure review. So we looked at certain programs. And although we recognized that the social protection system is much larger than that. So we weren't able to include all. And I'll enumerate them later on. So for labor market interventions, it's the same social protection system and national government social protection expenditures. For social welfare programs, we included NFA with implicit subsidy. So we were able to get this from the NFA accounts. Okay. The implicit subsidy that the NFA receives is that they receive tax exemption from importation of rice. So it's not an outlay on the part of government, but it's a ro loss in revenue. So that's why it's included here. Um, the social safety nets, and uh, well, we include all in the expenditures. For social insurance, we only include PhilHealth, indigent contributions paid by the national government, and GSIS emergency loans. Okay. This is just for the data, though we recognize that the social protection system is much broader. So here are the programs divided by type. Okay, so we have labor market interventions, we have the special employment program for students under the DOLE, and the education assistance program under the NCIP. Okay, so it was classified as a labor market intervention. Under social safety nets, these are more emergency short-term programs. We have core shelter program, assistance to individuals in crisis situations. Okay, the katas ng VAT para kay Lolo at Lola, it's still there because my, um, I started collect, uh, the data is reported is 2009. So this was still in effect in 2009. But now what they have for senior citizens is the social pension for indigent senior citizens. Okay, and then the katas ng VAT, Pantawid Corriente, it has the same story, it, uh, but, but that's over. So that's the, under the DSWD, and then we also include here the emergency calamity loan under the GSIS. Uh, for social insurance, we include the PhilHealth Indigent Program. And for the more long-term programs under the DSWD, well, it does receive bulk of, uh, it does implement the bulk of social protection programs. We have the livelihood and self-employment programs. We have the four Ps. We have the Kapit Bisid Laban sa Kahirapan Comprehensive and Integrated Delivery of Social Services, or Kalahisids, in case it's popularly known. 
And then, malusug na simula, mayaman na bansa, although now it's just called the Supplemental Feeding Program. This is under the DSWD. Under the DEP-ED, they have a school-based feeding program. Okay. Under the NFA, there's this rice price subsidy program. For the DA, there is seed and fertilizer subsidy for farmers. And for DOLE, there's family welfare program, workers with special concerns, and assistance to displaced workers, uh, AMP, adjustment measures program. And we have the implicit subsidy of the NFA. So that's the, these are the programs that we included in, the, in our collection of data for expenditures. This gives you an uh, overall picture of expenditure trends for social protection. From 2009 to 2017, it's been increasing, and the largest bulk goes to social welfare programs or long-term programs. That's the green line. So the red line is overall. The green line would be the social welfare programs, and then the rest, <laughs> the other two at the mm, near the uh, horizontal axis, are <laughs> labor market interventions and social safety net programs. Expenditure. Expenditure, Expenditure spot. Yes, it's just expenditures. Yes. So this one shows you the same thing, but as a proportion of total national government expenditures. Just to get an idea of how much uh, the proportion of national government expenditures that's spent on uh, social protection. So the, the peak here would be 7.7%. Okay, so that's the peak there. Seven point se what this says, 7.7% of national government expenditures for that particular year was spent on the social protection programs that we included. So that's, that's all that this says here. Um, the line below it, the brown line, would be the social welfare programs also. Okay. Now, some international comparisons. It is very, very challenging, and I think I have Toots to thank for this. He, he directed me this way, to compare <laughs> social protection system across countries. Um, you have different programs, measure it differently, data's not always available. So the ADB, in 2013, they took on this huge monumental effort to estimate a social protection index. And they did it for all countries, okay? Um, but the data is based on 2009 figures, okay? So the first column shows you the country. Here I'm just showing the regional, um, the regional countries, um, the figures for the region. Now the overall, well, let me define first. The ADB Social Protection Index is derived from total expenditures on social protection divided by the total number of intended beneficiaries of all social protection programs. So it's like a per beneficiary, it's not per capita, it's per beneficiary expenditure, okay? So they have both unweighted and weighted, okay? The unweighted is they divide it by program, expenditure, and beneficiaries of that particular program, and then they sum it all up, okay? But the weighted is that they just pull it all together. Um, you can take a look. Uh, I've cited the ADB study for this, uh, if you want to take a look at it. So in any case, so this is what it shows. Um, now, how do we read this? Let's say for the regional average, it's 9.4%, 9.4%. After you, they computed the total expenditures to total number of beneficiaries, they normalized it by multiplying it with 0.25% of GDP, or 0.25 GDP, because they defined that as the poverty line. It's hard to compare across countries, but that's what they did. That's a, just a normalization, 0.25 of GDP. So that's what they divided this by. So you come up with these figures, and what, how you read it would be, the regional average for overall social protection index is that 9.4% of um, poverty line expenditures is spent by the government. Or that is how much the government spends, 9.4% of um, poverty line expenditures. Okay, So they do it by type of social protection. So you have social insurance, social assistance, and neighbor market programs, okay? Now you see the averages at the bottom here. These are the averages at the bottom. And this is the Philippines in blue. So the Philippines were not much far from the average, or 8.5% for the overall SPI, 
we are 6.8% compared to the 7.7% for social insurance. Uh, for social assistance, uh, we are 1.1% compared to the 1.5% of the regional average. But we're faring pretty well in labor market programs according to this index in 2009, based on 2009 data. So we're 0.5%, um, which is higher than the regional average of 0.3%. But that's all I have to say about this because um, this is this was the best data that I could get that had international comparisons. Okay. Now, I will try, although we're already pressed for time. Um, the report defines the programs and looks at the evolution of each of the programs by by agency. Okay, so perhaps I can just focus on some. Uh, and then if you want, you can just take a look at the, the report. Um, I might have to leave the GOCCs out. Okay, I'll just discuss the DA. Uh, of course, the SWD is important and them and so here. For the Department of Agriculture, we have the Seed and Fertilizer Program, which is the primary social protection program of the DA. These are, this is data from 2009 to 2017. Now, what I want to highlight here is the importance of monitoring and evaluation. Because COA reports and impact assessments have influenced the evolution of programs that I will be sharing with you today. So for this one, in 2007, a COA audit report found the, an ineffective implementation of this particular program. Okay? The, the seeds that they had procured was not what the farmers needed. Um, it was handled poorly, so it resulted in spoilage, wasn't delivered um, uh, on time, or there were ghost deliveries. So there's a COA report. This is a 2007 COA report, and you can see it there. So that was important. So so there, w there was a change in both administration and the design of the policy. In 2014, it became more consultative. Uh, what do the farmers need? What kind of fertilizers do you need? What kind of... So that's, that's how it evolved. And now I think there are also talks of improving the design of this policy, but I'm not... I'm not um, perhaps my colleague here would know more about it. The one who focuses on agriculture. Okay, so this is Department of Education. Their main uh, social protection program is the school-based feeding program, which also evolved from so many different kinds of programs. So here it shows you that um, from 2009 to 2017, uh, its share to total debit expenditures is very small. It's less than 1.5 percent. Okay, um, it experienced a dip 2010 to 2014, but then it picked up again. Okay, uh, the debit School-based feeding program evolved from the breakfast feeding program, okay, that was enhanced by the DEPED based in part on recommendations of an impact assessment of the earlier program, of which Toots also <laughs> was involved in. He's involved in a lot of things in 2015. So that led to an improvement in the design and change to school-based feeding program. Now, earlier DEPED feeding programs include the breakfast feeding program that started 1997, the supplemental food program that was renamed to Malusug na Simula Mayama na Bansa in 2007. The DSWD also has this, um, but then it was decided that the DSWD focus on daycare centers, children in daycare centers. So the DEPED would focus of, with those in the schools. Okay, So that's also part of the evolution, and that's why it's important to, consistent par to continuously redesign policy and programs to see how you can more effectively um, reach those intended beneficiaries. Now the latter, the Food for School program of 2005 was discontinued in 2009-2010 based on a DBM assessment that the program no longer delivered its intended outcomes. And I'm sure some of us would recall here when the overpriced noodles purchased by DepEd issue came about. Um, not all, there are some young, young, young here in the audience as well, but in any case, so there. So this is Dole, there's really not much to say about this. Um, there's a special uh, employment program for students, um, and this shows you the share of spending on this particular program to total national government expenditures. Okay, so this program has been around for quite some time. Uh, it was the highest in 2009, and then it's you know um, up and down there until 2017. Now the, the, the graph, the figure on the right shows the share of DOLE, social welfare programs, uh, to total national government expenditures, particularly the assistance to displaced workers. They have this kind of program there. And the family welfare program, or workers with special concerns. 
Okay. Now, 2017, there's no more data reported there for the Assistance to Displaced Workers program, but it's still existent because they already consolidated their, their programs. Okay. Now, this is th this shows figures for DSWD, okay? and it shows the share of DSWD social protection programs to total national government expenditures in percent from 2009 to 2017. Okay, and it peaked in 2015, okay, and it's recovering in uh, 2017. So there. Now, um, from 2009 to 2017, total DSWD social protection programs received increasing shares of, the nat of national government expenditures, averaging 0.04%. Okay. Within the DSWD budget, allocations to social protection programs received an average of 45%. So the bulk of their budget goes to social protection programs. Uh, among the DSWD social protection programs, the four piece receives the largest share. Uh, programs such as Kalahi Seeds, Livelihood and Self-Employment programs, the, uh, and SOCPEN follow the four piece in terms of expenditure shares, though the latter program received the largest increase since 2015. And again, Toots wrote something about <laughs> oh, the SOCPEN. So supplemental feeding program and assistance to individuals in crisis situations are the other remaining DSWD programs. Well, now, what have been the changes in social protection programs? And here I'd like to highlight how there is an effort to redesign. And I think this effort to redesign and how to target your programs should be a continuous effort. Um, some DSWD projects were initially funded by development partners, but were later continued by the national government. This would be the Kalahi Seeds. Now, there were efforts to design and continuously improve a national Tar household, sorry, household targeting system with the implementation of the four piece and now expanded SOCPEN program. And audit reports and impact assessments appear to have contributed to changes as well in the design of programs and LA fears regarding the programs. Uh, like before, um, Dr. Pakayo here did something on um, the four piece people were afraid where the parents would spend the money. So they were able to show empirically that it was not what they feared that it would be spent on things other than for the, the child. That's the intended beneficiary. Now, general findings and next steps. Well, there, as earlier, there is a need to continuously improve the design of government programs, especially when it comes to programs that redistribute income to a targeted group. Uh, furthermore, improving the targeting system is critical in improving the design of a program. In any public policy program, there is always the risk of an eligible person being excluded from the benefits or including someone who is not the intended beneficiary. So this would be the type 1, type 2 error that some of us will know. Now the redesign of a program could also lead to the consolidation or refocusing of programs within or even across agencies with similar objectives and functions. And I think this is also very important, the coordination across um, national government agencies. Um, also, there is a need to, rather, to improve both design and targeting. There is a need to monitor and evaluate the efficiency and effectiveness of the program. This must be evidence-based to be able to intelligently assess future policy direction. However, that of course would depend on the availability timely availability of consistent data. So thank you uh, very much. Thank you so much for that uh, very informative presentation, Dr. Sikat. Our next speaker is a supervising research specialist here at the PIDS. She has done work related to decentralization, local governance, research and development, productivity, urbanization and population, health, education, social welfare, social protection, child protection, government taxation and expenditure, water policy indicators, and MDGs and SDGs. Currently, she is doing her PhD in public policy at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public uh, Policy at the, Univer the National U University of Singapore. Her PhD thesis focuses on health devolution and service uh, delivery in the Philippines. Friends, let's all welcome Ms. Janet Cuenca. Good afternoon. Buhay pa po ba tayo? 
may <laughs> kasi baka mabore kayo do sa presentation ko kasi most I think of the uh, info written in the slides are already known to you but may mga pasabog akong ilan. <laughs> So basically, the topic for this afternoon is health devolution in the Philippines, lessons and insights. So as intro, um, yeah, uh, outline mo ng presentation ko, outline of my presentation, intro, objectives of the study. Then I'll um, discuss health devolution in the Philippine context and then implications of health devolution. The OH response to health devolution and then lessons and insights from the health devolution experience. So this is one of the three essays that I that I'm writing for my PhD thesis. The second one is already done. I'm completing the third one. Okay. So the enactment of the local government code of 1991 changed the way basic government health services are delivered at the local level. So from a highly centralized system of health service delivery with DOH as the sole provider to a devolved system with LGUs as providers of health services. And the objective is to achieve efficiency and effectiveness of health service delivery by reallocating decision-making capi uh, capability and resources to LGUs. So basically, my study attempts to document the country's experience in health devolution with focus on DOH efforts to make it work. And in the process, it aims to draw lessons and insights that are critical in assessing the country's decentralization policies and also in informing future policymaking. So this is the health devolution in the Philippine context. So basically, um, here's a list of the devolved health services to um, LGUs. So you see at barangay level, the devolved health services include maintenance of Barangay Health Center, and then for municipality, um, the devolved health services include implementation of programs and projects on primary health care and child care, maternal and child care, and communicable and non-communicable uh, disease control services, and so on. And for province, um, the devolved health services are the maintenance of hospitals and tertiary health uh, services. For city, all the services and facilities of the municipality and province. So uh, here's a list of those programs included in the primary health uh, services in RHUs and BHS. And then for secondary health services, um, they refer to medical services that are accessible in some RHUs, infirmaries, district hospitals, and outpatient uh, departments of provincial hospitals. Tertiary health services include medical and surgical diagnostics, treatment and rehab care provided by medical specialists in a hospital setting. Uh, um, I want to emphasize this uh, um, point here that DOH takes on the residual powers and functions that include oversight or general supervision of the health sector, monitoring and evaluation fun functions, formulation of standards and regulation, and provision of technical and other forms of assistance. However, okay, Section 17F of the Code states that the national government or the next higher level of local government unit may provide or augment the basic services and facilities assigned to a lower level of local government unit when such services or facilities are not made available or if made avail available are inadequate to meet the requirements of its inhabitants. So, siguro sa kontekstong to, maintindihan natin bakit buhos yung pera ng DOH pa rin sa LGUs despite the health devolution. Kasi may ganyan eh. <laughs> Yan yung... Okay. So, etong figure na to, uh, it speaks a lot about um, how the uh, health... Uh, 
sector was devolved to the local governments. So makikita nyo po, sa personnel, 78,080. So na-devolved uh, about 46,080. And then sa facilities, almost all health, health facilities were devolved to LGUs. Um, but uh, gusto ko i-highlight yung budget, maraming naiwan sa, sa national government, sa DOH. Hindi ko po alam kung bakit kasi wala pa ako sa, <laughs> hindi ko pa interest tong uh, topic na to. But um, baka masasagot ng mga taga-DOH, <laughs> meron po bang dumating? <laughs> Yusek Lilibeth. Okay, so um, the massive transfer of personnel, health facilities and budget had an overwhelming effect on the health sector. Thus, making health devolution the most dynamic and complex scheme in the entire decentralization process. Hindi po galing sa akin yan. Galing yan kay Mer Mercado et al. <laughs> and then, the Philippine health devolution experience can be considered as the most ambitious health decentralization initiatives ever undertaken in Asia, according to World Bank. However, there are only limited direct references to health services and its organization in the code. And such treatment for the largest and most complex basic government service indicates that uh, the little regard for technical aspects that are crucial to the delivery of basic health services. So, keynote ko dyan si ano, Dr. G.P. Perez. And also, health service delivery is the toughest technical challenge for, for LGUs. You can imagine the, the, ano po, the bulk of our responsibilities that were given to, to ano, LGUs. Okay, so to facilitate the implementation of health devolution, um, DOH Task Force on Decentralization drafted in August 1992 the DOH Rules and Regulations, or ito yung IRR, which provides the guidance on devolution of health functions, transfer of DOH personal assets and appropriations of local governments, and DOH regulatory functions among others. Also, DOH created in December 1992 the LGAMS. Um, initially ad hoc unit siya, but then in 1994 it became a line item in the DOH uh, budget. So basically the LGAMS is expected to serve as a liaison between the DOH and LGUs. Um, also, the ILG, through the Bureau of Local Government Development, formulated the master plan for the code to sustain the momentum of decentralization process. Okay, so he, here are the phases of health devolution. So, yung period 1992-1993, change over phase siya. And then yung transition phase, 94-96, and then the stabilization phase, 1997 onwards. Okay, so for issues and challenges, before health devolution, DOH recognized that many of the LGUs might be facing resource constraints. So merong policy dilemma, dilemma, whether or not to devolve health services to LGUs. But there is wisdom in doing it because of the urgency of local action in providing health services without seeking top level intervention. However, the fact remained that many LGUs were not ready for the devolution in terms of both financial and human resource. So fiscal capacity of LGUs and managerial capability of local chief executives were not considered prior to the devolution. So there was no sufficient uh, preparation that would enable all those affected by health devolution to cope with the tremendous change it brought. Orientations, particularly on the local health board, were conducted in 1994, that is a year after the actual dev, uh, devolution. A strategic plan for the introduction of health dev devolution was also lacking according to Grandi et al. So here are the long-standing issues in uh, health uh, devolution. Financing for health. So there's a mismatch between era and the cost of devolved functions. Cost of implementing the Magna Corta for public health workers as mandated in RA 7305 of 1992 was not factored in the CODEF estimation, which put more strain on LGU's limited budget 
but um, baka naman with the recent development on the SU ruling on uh, ERA for LGUs, baka na ma-address na tong issue na to. Um, that remains to be seen. Health personnel, um, resistance from devolved DOH personnel and LGUs, that is to absorb the cost of devolved ano, staff. And geographical job displacement due to political differences between the local chief executives and health personnel at the early stage of health, uh, or health devolution. Magna Carta for, PH, uh, for public health workers has perverse impact on the relationship between the LGU health office and the rest of the LGU personnel because health workers' uh, compensation is higher relative to others because of Magna Carta, not to mention the other additional pay or benefits that they get from the Field Health Capitation Fund, or it's called now Field Health Trust Fund for, for per family payment. Um, also, issues on organizational or structural change. Um, it relates to issues on whether the local health boards and the interlocal health zones are functional. And also issue on fragmentation of health servi services because health devolution disintegrated the chain of healthcare delivery system when the administration of health services was transferred from the provinces to different jurisdictions such as barangays, um, municipalities and cities. So you, nagkaroon ng separation of admin control. So from kung dati kontrolado lang ng probinsya, ng provincial government yung delivery ng service, nalipat sa sa munisipyo, mga munisipyo at saka mga cities yung ibang ano health services. So ito yung nakita ko na response ng DOH to health devolution for the early stage of health devolution, as I've mentioned already, they created the LGOMS. They also had the CHICA, and then the DOH Health Development Fund, and then the ICHSP. I will, I will not uh, discuss this in detail. It's in the paper. And then the, the major ones, the health sector reform agenda, which includes hospital system reforms, public health reforms, etc. And then the 2005 to the, 2010 Formula One for Health, uh, which includes health financing, health regulation, health service delivery, and good governance in health. So basically, they used PIPH as instrument in forging uh, partnership with LGUs, pero hindi rin to na sustain. And then we have uh, AHA, the Aquino Health Agenda, which is meant to improve stream and streamline and scale up reform interventions adapted in the HSRA and Formula One. AHA's implementation framework is kalusugan pang kalahatan. I think it's, it's very familiar to, to all of you. Um, it focuses on the poor to ensure that nobody will be left behind. Uh, the strategic thrust include financial risk protection through expansion in uh, field health enrollment and benefit delivery, improve access to quality hospitals and healthcare facilities, and attainment of the MDGs. So here are the lessons and insights that I uh, was able to draw in understanding the, the whole uh, health devolution experience. So, um, medyo surprising kasi mismong DOH, sa DOH na ano to, admission. Now, in retrospect, the present reality in the health sector is brought by several factors affecting the delivery of health services. And one of these is the devolution of health services to the local government units. Passing on the big responsibility of healthcare to LGUs was done with no noble intentions. But unfortunately, with inadequate preparation resulting in inappropriate and ineffective health service implementation. This statement highlights the importance of a well-planned and well-designed government policy to minimize, if not avert, unintended consequences. Um, this I quote from World Bank, hasty and unplanned decentralization, sometimes purely in response to political pressures, can create new problems. So I think this insight is deemed useful in crafting any public policy in the future. Uh, second, a highly decentralized public uh, delivery system brought about by the devolution of health services is regarded as a structural weakness. 
based on Solon and Hirin, the implementation of the various health reforms has been challenged by the decentralized environment. So parang pagtitingnan, problemado pala yung pagka-devolve ng, uh, ng health ano, healthcare, ng health services. But then, so mapapaisip ka tama ba na nag-devolve tayo ng, ng, ano, ng, dinevolve natin yung health uh, sector. So, but then, sinasulon and hirin pa rin clarify that it is the way the way health devolution was implemented that fragmented public health service delivery and financing. Yun naman pala, na depende sa design. So dapat talaga sa tingin ko, konektado pa rin sa unang point ko, um, the, the policy should be well planned and well, well designed para hindi tayo magkaroon ng problema. Um, so, nasaan ako? I just want to, to point out this uh, important, I think, insight by Regmi that the most appropriate level of decentralization in the health systems is an important unresolved policy debate. Kasi mapapaisip kayo, saan ba talaga dapat na level mo siya i-decentralize? Sa province level ba? Sa munisipyo? Or ano, gusto mo ba iakit na lang siya sa regional level? Which is yung, yung mga discussion recently with the uh, federalism. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Wala po kayo narinig. <laughs> ah, naka-live stream, hi. <laughs> Sa mga pro-federalism. <laughs> okay. Okay, third point. Some LGUs are better able to reap the benefits of health devolution. Existing literature points to success stories or good practices. The interesting questions to us are, why is this so? What are the factors that make health devolution work for these LGUs? So insights lessons can be drawn from their, from their experience and thus it would be useful to take a closer look at their experience and find out how good practices can be replicated in other LGUs, but with a caveat, baka kailangan ng modifications to adapt to specific LGU context, if necessary. And then fourth, a number of health reforms have already been initiated to achieve national objectives for health. However, the effectiveness of these reforms is constrained by varying priorities or thrust of political leaders and even the OH secretaries through time. So sustainability of health reforms is not assured in every change of political administration unless they are mainstream, that is passed into law. By the time that some health reforms take root and reap the expected benefits, they are replaced by new ones due to change in political administration or lack of political traction. So mainstreaming of health policy reforms through enactment of national laws can ensure sustainability of reforms. So but, um, may mga nauna naman nang napasa na batas like yung uh, reproductive health law, di ba? And then we have now the Universal Health Care Act. So lastly, very few studies have attempted to do review and assessment of these health reforms. Insights lessons can be drawn from the country's experience with these reforms and they can inform future public policies. So it is noteworthy that health devolution per se is a health reform to improve health service delivery and thus it, is also, uh, it also needs to be assessed, especially that it has been in effect for 27 years now. So with that, I end my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much for that enlightening and meaningful discussion with Cuenca. I'd like to remind, remind everybody that we are being live streamed. Okay, so for our last speaker, okay, uh, this afternoon we have here a research fellow here at the PIDS. He coordinates the Institute's um, research program on population, health, and nutrition policy. He is also a member of the National Transfers Account Project, a global network of researchers and academics that constructs and analyzes economic life cycle accounts that measures how people at each age produce, consume, 
share resources and save for the future. He was a post uh, graduate research fellow at the East West Center in Honolulu and holds a PhD in economics from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. He was also a recipient of the 2016 Burnham O. Campbell Dissertation Award in Economics for his work, Health Over the Life Cycle, Essays on Health and Family. He obtained his uh, Master's of his Statistics and Bachelor Degree uh, in Development Studies, Manya Cum Laude, at the University of the Philippines. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Michael Abrigo. Thank you so much for that uh, kind introduction. Uh, this is a joint work with our uh, uh, research in ba? ASOC associate, uh, Danica Ortiz, but, in, but now she's at the House of Representatives. Hindi po siya ng Congress, lumipat lang po siya sa House. Well, this study is part of an ongoing um, series of work that we're doing here at the Institute uh, on health service delivery, uh, this is born uh, from our interest here at, at the Institute uh, in understanding the social determinants of health and also our frustration uh, with the limited uh, empirical evidences on, the, uh, on, the, uh, on this uh, topic. So uh, in 2017, we we, when, when I arrived, when I came back from, to the Philippines, uh, we did this um, uh, literature review uh, uh, on health service delivery, uh, decentralization in the Philippines. And what we found was that, uh, well, I quote here, the existing scholarship on the impact of decentralization on health in the country is characteristically thin and with varying degree of methodological rigor. Medyo may angas yung claim namin, but uh, that is what we found. Well, there, there's a lot of uh, res uh, research in this topic, but once, when you, but once you look at the way it was uh, designed, how it was implemented, the rigor of it, uh, yung studies, uh, actually what we found was that this just about, maybe lang mo sa kamay mo kung ilan yung mga studies that actually uh, measured the impact. And by impact, what we mean is that um, we can actually, uh, uh, as, ano, ataw dito? You, can, you can trace the, the causal effect decentralization and th that's a uh, very thin literature especially in health uh, well our frustration is that for for the past 25 years decentralization is like the scapegoat of the health sector pag sinabi may problema pag tinanong mo ang health sector anong problema sa, sa health sa Pilipinas is always decentralization and because this is about fragmentation about about so and such issues and I agree, uh, fragmentation is an issue. But when, when we did the study, what we found out that is that fragmentation was uh, was there even before decentralization. Maybe it's just a matter of how we measure fragmentation. And and uh, gusto lang natin siguro malinis na na cost causing effect na decentralization nga ba o hindi. And, and when we want to do cost and effect uh, analysis, we want to look at the results chain. San ba pumapasok yung decentralization sa usapan when, when we talk about health? So, lahat naman tayo, ang gusto natin is better health, greater access, which leads to better health. So that would be the outcomes. And to be able to come to that outcome, uh, we need health services, we need supply. So part of this would be from government, part of this will be from the private sector. And to be able to have that uh, output, health services, health supply, we need some inputs. So this would be the budgets, this would be manpower, this would be infrastructure institutions within government and in, in the market. And you need to, to transform this. You need to have some activities, processes that eventually lead to output. Yung decentralization would, could, could be an outcome, but not for health in, in this case, but it would be part of that input activities process chain. Uh, so. So what we want is what if med decentralization or voila, does this lead to better health services? And eventually look at access and then health outcomes eventually. So um, well, what we found in the literature is that, well, there is a need to separate ano ba yung impact on decentralization from the problems with decentralization, with how decentralization is framed, how it is implemented here in the Philippines. And because, uh, for, well, Decentralization was uh, was agreed upon. Kaya to napunta yan, kaya siya ginagawa natin kayon. Because there are well theoretical justifications bakit maganda ang decentralized uh, serv uh, service provision. 
One is because it's closer to the people, and this is the usual argument, because the, the, um, because the decision is closer to the people, then there would be more information available, and they would be able to decide ano ba yung kailangan ng mga tao in the ground. And also, because of decentralization, this would be competition and eventually better uh, services for everyone. And then on the other side, of course, there would be the issues about funding, uh, ano ba yung kailangan kong gawin, na, na discuss earlier. And also, there's also about the issue about spillovers, which is uh, very uh, important in health and some other sectors. Because with spillovers, well, kung yung kapitbahay ko may ospital, baka hindi ko na kailangan magumuha ng ospital. Baka, since sila man nagpapondo nun, makakalibad ako, pumunta na lang sila sa kapitbahay ko. Okay. So the big question, the million dollar question is, does decentralization of health services lead to greater access to healthcare services? Uh, it's a good question that we want to answer. Unfortunately, um, hirap siyang sagutin. For, for a number of reasons. One, uh, nung ginawa yung decentralization in the Philippines, it's a big bang. So nung 1992, sinabi, in 1991, sabi yung decentralize tayo, 1992, bang! Decentralized ang buong Pilipinas. And pag ganun nangyari, wala kang, wala kang comparison. So lahat tayo decentralized. Kung ako decentralized, kanino ako i-compare yung hindi decentralized? That's one problem. Uh, another problem, well, pwede naman siguro yung degree of decentralization. So, merong pinakita kanina ni um, Dr. Sikat, uh, John Sikat, merong mga areas na mas uh, decentralized, merong areas na mas centralized. Uh, there are areas na mas, uh, ang tawag dito, mas... Uh, mas uh, nakaano sa central government mas natawag dito mas nakakuha ng pera from central government so they rely more on the central government so mas centralized sila than others but then pag ganun yung usapan there are, there might be reasons why they are more centralized or decentralized baka kasi mas mahirap sila kaya kailangan nila ng mas maraming pera from the central government so medyo mahirap yung analysis and finally, uh, which part of decentralization? Ito yung mahirap, hindi masyadong tinitignan sa literature in terms of sa, sa health. So malaki kasi yung decentralization. Aling parte ng decentralization? Is, just, is it service delivery? Is it financing? Uh, ba? So, hindi ko sasagutin to dito sa presentation. I'll just... Uh, so what I do is, uh, titibagin natin ano ba yung part na yan. Bite size lang tayo ngayong hapon. So, Instead of answering that big question, I just want to answer these small questions and hopefully uh, uh, contribute to the, to the discussion. So, does greater local government income in a decentralized setting, so it's because of decentralization, but in a decentralized setting, result in greater access to healthcare services? Okay. So, pag ito yung tanong, pwede na natin siguro sagutin. But still, we need some um, exogenous variation, kumbaga kung ano yan, econometrics. Uh, para masabi natin, ano ba yung nagda-drive ng income? Fortunately, we have a natural experiment which is called the city ratification. So ano ba yung sabi ng batas natin uh, para maging kang city? So una, kailangan yung locally sourced income mo, if we're looking at the RA9009, dapat meron kang 100 million. Pag population, dapat meron kang at least 100, uh, 100 square kilometers na area. Or in terms of population, dapat meron ka 150,000 na population. So anything na kaya ka naging city pero hindi dahil dito, maybe that's exogenous. Kasi once you've controlled for this, ibig sabihin, ito lang yung rule natin eh, pero meron, bigla kang naging city. Okay? At bakit importante yun? Dahil alam natin lahat, pag ang isang uh, munisipyo naging city, meron siyang access sa ira na mas malaki. So that would, would eventually uh, lead to higher income. So para kang merong ano, mero kang windfall income just because pinalas ka after controlling for this nagikang city. Okay. Uh, so why so hindi ko sinabi rito uh, when, I, when I talk about healthcare services, uh, I look at antenatal care. Bakit antenatal care? Una, because antenatal care is important. Kung yung nanay pumupunta sa sa doctor or sa nurse or sa health uh, care uh, sa, sa healthcare worker pag siya ay buntis ma mabibigyan siya ng payo na kung ano mga dapat niyang gawin or kung meron mang problema yung anak niya or sa pagbubuntis niya mapapayuhan siya agad so this leads to uh, lower infant mortality pero more importantly uh, kasi itong mga services na to antenatal care these are locally provided 
So binibigay siya ng local government or even uh, uh, local local uh, local facilities. So just some uh, information about antenatal care, so trends. So for the past 25 years, we've seen a dramatic increase. Well, hindi mo masyadong dramatic, but there's an increase uh, in antenatal care in the Philippines. So uh, in 19... 1993, uh, about 85% of pregnant women visit a skilled provider for antenatal care. Uh, 25 years later, 94%. So that's an increase about, of about oh no, 10 percentage points. But when you look at the other uh, indicators, so, so gusto natin yung mga nanay mas maagang pumupunta sa mga doktor. So that would be the orange line. So from 43% uh, na pumunta nung in the first trimester, uh, 25 years later, 71% na siya. So that's about 30 percentage points increase. Uh, gusto rin natin mas frequent, hindi lang maaga, mas frequent siyang pumupunta para parati siya nabibigyan ng pay na susundan siya. So from 55% in 1993, 25 years later, 87% na. The, the, so so the, we have successes in antenatal care. And part of it because uh, mas accessible na yung mga, mga health professionals natin. So, so yung magpupunta sa doktor about the same less than uh, about 40 percent percent of women pero yung pupunta sa midwives nurses barang health workers uh, umakyat siya from about 45 percent to 55 percent over the past 25 years so overall uh, nasa six percent na lang po yung hindi pupunta for antenatal care from about uh, 15 percent 25 years ago. But when pag binasan natin yung data, we see uh, there's a large disparity by wealth, education, residence, and birth order. So, mas mayaman, uh, more likely to, to, to go for antenatal care, for education, uh, residence, pag nasa uh, urban area ka, mas more likely. But uh, across these classes, uh, socioeconomic groups, uh, between 1993 and 2017, lahat yan tumaas. Magkakaiba lang yung simula natin, tsaka iba-iba yung rates of increase. Uh, still, uh, magkakaiba din yung mga servisyo. Maybe uh, it's a function of saan ba sila pumunta. So kung BHW yan, uh, syempre wala naman silang, walang kalay-kalay na, na ang tawag dito, pang test yung mga BHW natin. So, so magkakaiba yung mga services na nakuha nila. Oh, so sagutin na natin yung tanong natin. Una, the city ratification lead to greater local government incomes and expenditures? Kasi ang idea natin, pag naging city, uh, once controlling for the other factors, tataas yung income and eventually expenditures ng mga local governments natin. Uh, hinati namin yung data. This is from the Bureau of Local Government Finance. Hinati namin yung mga municipio and cities. So those who were cities pre-RA9009, pre-2001, those who became cities after, and those who were never cities, so, kung makikita nyo dito sa right panel, that would be per capita income from local sources. So, locally generated to. So, before pa naging cities yung mga cities after 2001, pare-pareho lang naman sila nung iba pang munisipyo. But once na naging na silang city, konti pa isa-isaya naging silang city, lumalapit na sila dun sa itsura, dun sa trend nung mga city, older cities. And that's the same for per capita expenditure. So, tama yung hinala natin na pag nag lang city, ilas lang ngayaman. Pag, and, and this is from local sources, hindi lang, hindi ito yung transfers, ito yung nag-generate nila locally. Tapos, and this translates to uh, expenditures. Uh, next question. So, given na ganito, na tumaas yung income nila, does this uh, expansion in incomes of local governments translate to greater access to antenatal care services? So, meron tayong uh, apat na indicators. One is whether pumunta ba sila sa isang skilled professional. Ito yung uh, 94% kanina. So hinati-hati natin yung sources of income. So national transfers and local income. Tapos we've controlled for population income. Kung mapapansin nyo, ito yung mga yung local income and population. Uh, ito yung uh, predictor kung magiging siyang city. Tapos uh, we're controlling for uh, municip municipality fixed effects. So we're looking at own LGU income and even their neighbor's income. So do a base model, this is just ordinary least squares. We're just looking at own LGU income and we've corrected for the endogeneity of the national transfers using the cityhood ratification. So pag ito lang titignan mo, makita mo na negative ang effect actually ng national transfers. So pag mas malaki yung transfers, 
uh, less likely that they would uh, go to a skilled professional. But that is not the complete picture. Kasi itong mga governments na to, there, there's merong interaction sa, lo, sa, sa locality. So kung ako nanay, uh, hindi, lang na, hindi naman ako nakatali sa munisipyo ko. Pwede akong pumunta sa kapitbahay. Ganun din naman yung mga gobyerno, mga munisipyo, uh, depende sa kapitbahay ko kung ano yung mga services ay bibigay ko. Kung may hospital sa kapitbahay, siguro mag, meron pa rin ako mga RHU, BHS, pero hindi naman kasing laki nung binabayad nung merong mga hospital na munisipong kapitbahay ko. So when you look at it, uh, that way, yung national transfers controlling for the uh, neighborhood, yung mga neighborhood effects, wala nang impact yung transfers. Pero pag tinignan mo, kung yumaman yung kapitbahay ko, uh, less likely na pupunta ako sa isang uh, skilled professional. Hindi ko pa naiisip kung bakit. But that's a conundrum for me. Uh, siguro ang importante dito is that uh, pag tumaas yung local income, uh, more likely na pupunta yung nanay sa isang, uh, pupunta siya for antenatal care. At uh, significant yung interlocal spillovers. Next is whether pumunta ba siya ng maaga, uh, first trimester. Uh, ganun din yung kwento, positive, pag once you've controlled for the spatial effects, wala nang impact yung national transfers, uh, yung locally sourced income, so kung mas vibrant yung local economy mo, more likely na mas maagang pumunta yung mga nanay for antenatal care visits, and there's significant interlocal spillovers uh, in terms of income. Uh, Nakaka-boring na, pare-pareho yung, actually pare-pareho yung kwento, so dito we looked at uh, eight antenatal care visits, yung DOH kasi, Ang sabi nila, four lang yung required, pero yung WHO gusto nila eight. So we look at the more stringent eight. Ganun din yung kwento. So pag national transfers, uh, when you look at uh, spatial spillovers, uh, walang impact. Uh, yung locally sourced, uh, regardless kung own income mo or sa kapitbahay mo, uh, it leads to uh, increase in uh, more frequent antenatal care visits and there's significant uh, interlocal spillovers. And finally, yung ipapanganak mo na, uh, sa skilled attendant ba o sa hilot? O dito, uh, ganun din ang kwento. So, once you've controlled for uh, neighbor effects, wala nang impact yung national transfers on your own uh, LGU. Yung locally sourced income has a positive significant effect and there's, uh, and there's significant interlocal spillovers. So, ang tanong, bakit? Diba? So, bakit ganun ang kwento? So, ang gagawin natin, uh, follow the money. Pag, nag pag nag lang city, sabi natin, tataas yung income, tataas yung expenditure. Pero saan nila ginagastos? So, nung naging city sila, nakita natin na yung pera actually napupunta sa general public services, education, economic services. Wala sa health. Well, is it a bad thing? Uh, maybe it's bad for health, but maybe not for in, in general. Because maybe this reflects, this actually reflects that decentralization is working. Na ito yung mga kailangan nila sa lugar nila, kaya siguro dito na punta. So, pero wala akong sagut na, na doon. So, when you look at their income naman, dito kasi wala pang uh, influence yung neighbors mo. What if we take into account yung impact ng neighbors mo? So, ganun pa din, pag nagi kang city, yayaman, yayaman ka. Uh, per capita income wise, mas marami kang perang pang spend. Pero kung yung kapitbahay mo naging city, actually, masihirap ka by 0.5 log points. Dahil mas mahirap ka, uh, all things being the same, mas konti lang yung pera mong for spending. Ang tanong bakit? Well, meron ako mga naiisip, pero syempre wala naman akong evidence. Sasabihin ko sabihin. But that's, I guess, an important question na kailangang sagutin natin. Bakit? Pag, yumaman, pag naging city yung kapitbahay ko, bakit ako na naapektuhan negatively? Ang bottom line, dahil wala namang napunta nung naging city yung isang lugar, dahil yumaman siya, dahil naging city siya, at hindi naman napunta sa health, wala, wala, walang nangyari sa Barangay Health Station. So hindi, hindi naman dumami yung Barangay Health Station on average. Hindi dumami yung manpower per population natin on average. So dapat hindi tayo naghahap ng resulta. Dahil wala naman nangyari sa spending ng health nung yumaman sila. Okay? Uh, and even, uh, th there are some evidences na baka nga detrimental pa pag yung kapitbahay ko naman ang naging city ang yumaman. 
So I guess the um, key takeaways here is that well, women from more vibrant local economies, that is yung mga governments, uh, mga local government with greater income from local sources, have greater access to antenatal care services. And, th and these results are robust to, to throwing in uh, other different factors, including household characteristics. So regardless whether isama mo dyan yung uh, education, income, uh, wealth status nung, nung household, hindi nagbabago yung results. Uh, what is also interesting is that there is a positive spillover uh, from your neighbors getting richer from their uh, local income. So pag yumaman yung kapitbahay mo kasi naging mas vibrant yung economy nila and not because sa transfers, uh, meron siyang positive spillovers doon sa mga kapitbahay niya. Uh, we also found that uh, greater national to local transfers, dahil lagi silang city, does not necessarily translate to better health outcomes. So, at, well, at least hindi na, there's no discernible impact on access to antenatal care services. Kasi ito lang yung tinig natin dito. Uh, we also found that the windfall transfers do, no, do not go to health spending on average. And, I, and I've said, and it's not necessarily bad. Maybe it's bad for health, but for decentralization, maybe it's not bad. And I think major worrisome is the beggar thy neighbor effect. And this is important kasi kung ganyan ang kwentuhan, baka, baka dapat meron tayong gawin. Uh, and, but this needs uh, further analysis. Well, at the end of the day, uh, has the centralization failed? Well, hindi, hindi pa rin natin siya masasagot dito. At, at least uh, this, is part, this is part of that conversation. So moving forward, I guess, uh, fr from these results, uh, what I can say is that local development is the way to go. So if, if we want uh, better services available to, to our population, uh, baka hindi tayo dapat nakarelay sa local transfers. Uh, we, we need to develop our, our localities. Well, pa paano natin gagawin yun? H well, hindi siya, hindi ito yung papel na yun. Uh, there is a need to strengthen interlocal partnerships. For, 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 for these governments to internalize yung mga spatial spillovers, kung meron akong negative effects sa kapitbahay ko, baka dapat yung decentralization natin is not at the municipal level, maybe something higher. Uh, but then, this is easier said than done. There, ha there has been a number of attempts to do this. So we have interlocal health zones, provincial investment plans. Uh, pero, well, well, we're here, so maybe it's not, it's, it's there, so. And finally, what, what is it for UHC federalism? Uh, well, one, one point that you need to emphasize is that there is a need to recognize incentives. Bakit ba hindi nag-fail nag or but hindi na sustain yung mga successes natin dati? Maybe we need to, to look at the incentive structures ng mga local, health, local executives. Bakit hindi sila nakikipag-cooperate? Or kung, kung nakikipag-cooperate sila, ano pa yung kulang? Uh, and finally, I, I guess there's a need to consolidate the efforts. Uh, well, if we want to decentralize, maybe decentralization as it is now for health is not working. Asang level ba dapat yung decentralization? And this goes back yung, well, mahabang, mahabang usapan about this. Uh, if you want to read more about the technical details of these papers, uh, these are the references. Uh, ayan, my presentation. Marami pong salamat. Thank you so much for your comprehensive presentation, Dr. Abrigo. We will now proceed to the open forum. May I request our speakers to please occupy the front seats? Okay. And uh, may I also request our participants to please state your names and your affiliations before asking the question. We will be taking two questions at a time to be able to accommodate everyone. And please use our microphone at the back. would like to throw the first question yes sir magandang hapon po uh, dr faraon po uh, health policy and administration college of public health up manila uh, siguro po para sa ang uh, i was hoping i would come here and be happy pero parang depressing yung <laughs> yung presentation especially since i'm in public health uh, um, Siguro anyone could uh, answer. Do you do you see decentralization as a solution, or do you see it as a problem? Apparently, from the presentation, especially on the health side, it was actually overwhelmingly seen as a problem. Probably 
because it was as stated by Dr. Abrigo and uh, in part by uh, Ms. Cuenca as a big bang. It was just salpak, a salpak thing with no operations manual, no, no nothing. I was still young during that time, so I couldn't, I couldn't, uh, no, uh, really comment yung, uh, around the 1992, 19, uh, 1993, right? But I think the origin, when I teach kasi primary health care, I think primary health care al in Alma Ata is a very beautiful document. And we are in live in interesting times kasi kaka and ng 11223 which is UHC law and I think there's this study I siguro nasa gray ano pa area uh, recentralization at the provincial level it resounds it's a study by Lorenzo and I think Domingo the, it's the UHC study group uh, universal healthcare study group so uh, and I think the the new law uh, as part of the discussion of the IRR Meron tayong provincial health board na tinatawag. Doon daw ata ilalagay lahat yung pera. So, doon, and the concept of interlocal health zones, so there's no longer, terms lang naman yan eh. I think kung sino yung nakaupo, kukuha lang siya ng thesaurus. And then ano ba yung synonym for universal? Comprehensive, comprehensive universal, primary health care for all. So, uh, what is it that, uh, do, do you believe that uh, centralization at the provincial level will work. Do you think, ang, ang, I think kasi uh, Dr. Sikat discussed it, uh, uh, financial, political, yung, yung mga variations. Wala kaya dun sa part naman ng, ng, ano, ng uh, demand side. The demand side, do we really market it first? I mean, do we ask the people what do they need? Wala atang part na ganun eh. When they said it, Yung nga, sabi ni sir, uh, ayan na, gawin nyo na. Uh, uh, low na kasi. So you have to do it. Do we ask this, the, the demand side, what are these things that you need? I think it's a solution kasi nga, uh, it's you. It's a participatory kasi dapat ang ano eh. You consult the people, what do you need? The local government unit heads, they know the resources, so you allocate your resources. Uh, fragmentation, I think could be seen as a problem, it could also be seen as a solution. Parang malaki na kayo, alam nyo na yung problema nyo, so kaya kayo bumubukod. So together we're one country, fragmented, yes we are, but if you are productive, each one of you, you will contribute to the whole. So ang aking question is, <laughs> meron kayang solution? Is it, is it uh, being seen as a solution, at least health-wise? Hindi ko natitingnan yung pangkalhatan, although of course, I know that... Uh, in the six building blocks, it's governance that is really more important as a building block in a health system. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Faraon. Dr. Pakeo. I'll ask my question. Um, but first, uh, I'd like to uh, congratulate the uh, speakers. Uh, very provocative. Um, Michael just uh, presented a really beautiful paper, very focused. Um, and But he just complicated the question about is this a, a solution? Um, why we say it's, it's become complicated? Because in effect, you focused on and documented externalities. The interjurisdictional externalities complicates uh, what one of the speakers, I think it was Justin or Janet, says, until now, we have not resolved the question about what's the optimal uh, location or, or, or jurisdiction. Uh, and, and if you have spillover effects, that's really, that complicates that. Um, now. Having noted that, my, my question really uh, stems from your observation, and in my view, correctly so, that we failed in the decentralization. And part of that is the hurried nature, the Big Bang approach, ill-prepared, etc. So my question is this. There is coming up 
a bigger, much bigger decentralization called federalism, which I feel it's very, I think, haphazard the way it's being discussed even. Not to talk about design. So, what's your view? Okay. So thank you for that provocative question, Dr. Pakeyo. Okay, by the way, uh, would like to answer first a question raised by Dr. Faraon. Yung, yung tanong po nyo is kung sagot yung recentralization at the province level? Yes. Tama po ba yung gets ko dun sa question? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, sige po. Um, ganito na lang, oh. ganito ko po sasagutin yung question nyo. Kasi, you know, para tayong lalakad sa ano nito, <laughs> naka-live streaming po tayo. <laughs> Pero hindi, ito, seriously, seriously po, no? Kasi, um, yun po kasing objectives ng decentralization ay maganda naman talaga. That is to improve uh, service delivery, tapos to promote e efficiency, Kasi di ba po, mas alam ng mga local uh, governments, local officials, kung ano yung preference at saka yung needs nung, nung mga constituents nila. And in terms of urgency po, nung mga, uh, um, tag dito, um, urgency nung needs na yon parang ang hirap naman kung iasa natin from, from uh, higher level pa ng government yung intervention. Eh, kailangan-kailangan na ng ng local ano po local uh, constituents so sa akin po um, sa tingin ko solusyon yung decentralization at mm, gusto ko pong ipaliwanag na yung decentralization at saka yung federalism magkamag-anak po sila kung tutuusin um, very decentralized na po tayo um, medyo iba lang po yung structure ng ng decentralized na regime ang naiisip nun sa mga nagtutulak nag, ano nagtutulak ng ng federalism kasi gusto nilang iakyat sa sa regional level yung yung pag-deliver po ng mga services so alam naman po ninyo marami ng pag-aaral ang ginawa si Dr. Manasan about this meron ding ibang pag-aaral yung mga ibang researchers scholars so ang sa akin po kasi parang Ang mahirap pong sagutin kung solusyon ba siya, problema ba siya. Sa tingin ko po kasi dapat ito yung klase ng ng uh, pulisiya na dapat inuupuan. Parang dapat talaga pinag-uusapan kasi halimbawa po sa sa healthcare. Parang pagtitingnan, parang tama ba na yung hospitals din evolve mo sa provincia provinces? Kaya ba talaga ng probinsya na mag generate ng revenues to maintain provincial hospitals. Kasi pag titingnan po sa ngayon, karamihan ng mga provincial hospitals um, hindi hindi na maintain. Kaya nga po, di ba, to the rescue yung DOH, HFEP natin, di ba po? Kasi alam, alam na eh, alam na ng DOH na hindi talaga kaya ng local governments na maintain yung mga hospitals, health facilities. So, baka po, ang sa tingin ko, baka dapat hinihimay po natin Himayin natin lahat ng uh, health services and then tingnan, uh, ito ba, uh, sa ang level mo siya i-devolve? Um, dapat ba i-maintain mo to sa national level? DOH yung bahala. Tapos um, yung mga, kasi sa ngayon po may mga existing na, na arrangement eh. Yung, yung parang hatian ng national government at saka local government. Halimbawa, 
sa immunization. Klaro po sa atin yun, di ba? Na yung vaccine, sagot ni DOH. Yung logistics, sagot ni LGU. Although, may mga nakausap ako sa DOH na kahit ultimong cotton, uh, pinuprovide pa rin ni, ni DOH. So, sa akin po, ano eh, parang dapat himayin natin bawat, bawat uh, health services. And then tingnan ano yung kakayan nung level of government na i-provide yun. Pwede kasing shared yung, yung delivery. Di ba? Pwedeng NG, LGU. Parang katulad nung sa immunization. Or pwede namang talagang ibigay na natin kay national government yung mga health facilities. Kasi ang laki po kasi nung ano nun eh. Ang laki kasi nung capital outlay nun. So, uh, mali ba na lang po kung yung, yung recent development nga dun sa SC ruling on ERA. Kasi di ba yung ERA dati, nakabase lang siya sa internal revenue. Tapos yung si SC ruling, dapat pala yung ERA, nakabase siya sa national, total national taxes. So malaki po yun. So may implication yun sa pwedeng magasta ng mga local governments in delivering the, ano po, the services, in maintaining the hospitals, yung po ano pang inaasahan po sa kanila. So sa akin po, ayaw kong sagutin kung problema siya or solusyon. Sa akin po, mm, kailangan pag-aralang mabuti. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, I just want to answer. I, I have three points. Uh, first is what, when we want to assess the centralization, we want to hold on to the issue of what is the impact of the centralization, uh, the centralization on its own. And there are issues about uh, implementation. There are different issues. There are many implementation issues, definitely. But then uh, there is beauty in decentralization. Actually, what we found in our study, once we've uh, once we've looked at the rigor, yung mga more rigorous studies about the centralization actually found that it's actually good. Uh, it, it leads to uh, lower infant mortality rate, um, more investments in health. So th that's what we found. Um, yung tanong na, um, is the centralization good? Well, I guess maybe, dun masasagot yun. Pero at, yung tanong na, at what level, uh, at least in, in this study, we found that there's spillovers. Meron mga spillovers na hindi naka-capture ng mga munisipyo. So maybe, well, kung probinsya man yan, I guess it's better than munisipyo, pero kung ano pa yung optimal, hindi, hindi natin kayang sagutin for now. Uh, okay, so thank you for those questions. And my colleagues here bravely answered it as well. Um, I agree. Um, it's hard to say it failed or it succeeded, but um, I've been studying this for quite some time. Uh, Janet is right in that um, decentralization and federalism are related. I've always believed that it's important to bring government, whatever part, whichever function, closer to the voters as it, as it may be. So that's, that's the crucial role of the assignment of both expenditures and revenue raising. So that has to be examined as well and revisited. And we did that. I remember a story before that, before decentralization, if you were a mayor in, let's say, Surigao, and you wanted to buy a typewriter, at the time, it was still a typewriter, um, you had to go all the way to Manila. And there were no airplanes at the time. You know, you had to travel. And then, so it was very, very costly. The transactions cost um, were possibly reduced with bringing some of the functions closer to the local government itself. Um, so there are also, you also must consider the externalities, that, like the spillover effects that um, my colleagues here were saying. So it's hard to say. That's why Mike and you know Janet and I, we all said we, there still needs to be more studies done. We still really have to examine this more. So thank you. Thank you so much. Follow-up question, Dr. Faraon. Do you see decentralization as a one shoe? Fits all. Remember, we are 7,107 aisle. Or would you prefer uh, customized shoes for everyone? Like customized decentralization for Ilocos. Customized. Kasi nga, di ba, we are variable. Uh, laki ng variability. Eh. Resources wise, variable. Uh, literacy. It's another issue, eh, yung health literacy. Yun. Um, would you say, tapos siyempre ang kukumpas dyan ng policy director is of course national. Opo. Uh, medyo mahirap din po sagutin yan kasi may political ano kasi implications. Sa tingin nyo ba, okay lang sa mga governors at saka mayors na bawian nyo sila ng, ng power? Kasi pag sinabi nyo po na 
i-customize mo. So, ibig sabihin, hindi siya talaga fully, I mean, in terms of uh, healthcare or health services, fully devolved po tayo, di ba? So, parang, ang sa akin po, uh, may ano yan, um, uh, kasi di ba, parang ang hirap. Pangalawa, uh, ano nga itong nasi isip ko kanina? <laughs> Nawala bigla. Um, yun, yung, yung po kasing sinasabi nyo, yan po kasi yung inadapt na decentralization sa China. Asymmetric decentralization. So, itong asymmetric decentralization na to, tin tinitingnan yung kapasidad ng local government kung kaya. Kung kaya, o oh, sige, go. I-decentralize sa'yo yung service. Kung hindi, hindi ka, hindi, hindi ka bibigyan ng, ano, ng, ng, ng power to to deliver. Kaya lang po sa akin kasi at this point na nasa pa ilang anong anong pecha na 27 years na po kasi yung ano yung yung health devolution. So hindi ko po alam kung kaya talagang bawian ng or baka po more on redesign lang. Wag naman ganun ka ka antag doon. Yeah, drastic. Baka po pwedeng unti-unti i-redesign. Ang, ang actually po, ang alam ko, merong ginagawa sa ADB or ginawa sa ADB na pag-aaral na tinitingnan po yung uh, expenditure assignments ng, na, na, na nabigay sa mga LGUs. Tapos, ang alam ko per, ano yun eh, per sector po. So, ito yung sinasabi ko kanina na baka dapat himayin mo siya, tingnan mo kung ano ba yung kakayahan ng level of government na yon na i-provide tong service na to. Kung hindi, pw pwede kasing shared or fully devolved or retained sa... Katulad po, di ba, uh, most of you know na yung karamihan ng mga DOH regional hospitals, ni-retain po siya sa, ano, sa, sa DOH kasi talagang lalong alaki ng capital outlay po nun. At gusto ko lang i-relate dun sa findings ni, ni Mai kanina na parang dun sa findings mo, Nung tumataas yung income, parang walang spending yung city on health. Sa tingin ko kasi isang factor na dapat mo rin tingnan, most of the regional hospitals kasi, or yung mga parang DOH finance hospitals, nasa sa cities. So kung tutusin ang swerte ng cities, wala silang gasto sa hospitals. Kasi yung probinsya yung gumagastos for the, for the hospitals. Yun po. Thanks. Dr. Abrigo, would you like to add something? Or Dr. Sikat? Okay. Yes, sir. Dr. Ag Ay, Mr. Agustin, your question, please. I'm Dan, Dan Agustin, uh, Masagana, Land Bank of the Philippines, and also uh, DOH by uh, East Avenue Medical Center as a uh, member of its uh, uh, review ethics board under the DOH. Now, uh, <clears throat> during the DOST conference last November, our guest speaker was the chairman of the indigenous group. And he was mentioning that uh, our indigenous uh, would avail of services via yung traditional health medicine nila. I hope uh, this should be taken into consideration because I asked him, have you patented your studies? In Taiwan, they do, uh, according to the Taiwanese speaker. So I hope uh, you would include that. And uh, again, I would like to uh, congratulate you for your sharing your expertise. And uh, also uh, to Dr. Sikat, uh, say, uh, I used to be also a part of the Masagana 99 of President Marcos. And during that time, I feel as part of it, the RICE program was very successful. And uh, we have a uh, agriculturist. I am from Maguindanao. And uh, we used to harvest only, say, 35 cavans per hectare. But because of the health of the agriculturists who were trained there by UP Los Banos people and uh, as mandate by President Marcos, the yield there 
went up. The target was 99, more than 99 kawans. Later on, however, with the local government code, these agriculturists, as you have mentioned, I think, went to the mayor's office. And now, well, we do not see the agriculturists in the field. Um, but when you spoke on design, I would like to congratulate uh, PIDs because of the rice tarification, which was studied by PIDs, particularly of Dr. Briones. Okay. You mentioned seedlings uh, and fertilizer. Now, uh, these are inputs very vital in agriculture. And uh, with the law now, with the rice tarification, okay, I hope you can include this in your study uh, because it will be implemented this year. Not only uh, will there be a, a help in terms of seeds, now because of the so-called RCEP or the uh, funds to be generated by the rice tarification, which is approximately 10 billion, the uh, government now will allocate uh, 5 billion for mechanization assistance to the rice producers, okay? And uh, also training, uh, training, there will be training. Uh, there's a need for training for our rice producers and farmers. And uh, there will be assistance now, uh, uh, also in terms of the seedling that uh, they will implement the certified seeds. And uh, of course the funding will be through a land bank and uh, and uh, DVP, and uh, which should be well, uh, uh, what to call this? Uh, not very strict in terms of the uh, requirements. So I hope you can uh, continue this because this is now the redesign of uh, and further include the redesign uh, as you speak of, and also the redesign in the health. You study also the assistance by the indigenous people. And also, uh, you know, the time of President uh, Ro, uh, Ramos, he put up yung, and uh, Pangasinan, ano yung mga albula, alborale, or sa quote, quote, unquote, <laughs> di ba? Because these are availed. Uh, I am from the mountain of Maguindanao. And uh, during our time, there was a puriculture center. But yung malalapit na, we availed of the services of the so-called uh, barrio, what you call this, untrained. But some of them were trained also by the DUHs in terms of services. Thank you very much. Okay. I, uh, okay, your suggestions are well noted, sir. Okay, um, would you like to say something, Miss Janet? Yeah, actually, yung sinasabi niya na yung mga albularyo, di ba po? Hindi, hindi totoo kasi ano eh, naging party na sila ng mga barangay health workers. Yung mga nag-volunteer na health workers. At least sa Batangas po ganun. Yung mga albularyo sa amin. Para makita mo ay active na active na ano, na barangay health worker. Okay, thank you. Question ma'am. Please. Lely Craft from the School of Econ. Uh, one question, uh, several questions addressed to the three. Okay, uh, okay, Dr. Sikat, hi. Um, you mentioned the trend in um, spending as a share of GDP for the social protection programs. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's in the paper. I'm sorry, I haven't read it. But would you have per capita spending for the intended beneficiaries uh, to have an indication of whether in both nominal and absolute and real terms, the spending per ben intended beneficiary has been increasing. I mean, I think that is what the social protection index was meant to do, but maybe, you know, I mean, uh, okay, for instance, in the four piece, I know that the benefits have just been the same ever since it was instituted, uh, but with inflation, <laughs> we don't know. Uh, whether in real terms the incentive is still there and the assistance in, is still there. The other thing I think in the health sector, uh, you mentioned PHIC support for the premium, the indigent premiums. I'm also wondering whether you already also included the PAGCOR and the PCSO assistance. Uh, we know that uh, the second line of defense of uh, the indigent when they're 
PhilHealth reimbursements are not enough would be to seek assistance from PCSO, lahaban ng pila dun. But anyway, that's just a, a minor comment. And um, meron bang, uh, I'm not sure if there are feeding programs implemented by FNRI? Meron ba? Or they just monitor? I'm, I'm not sure about that. But I think kasi in the NNS, they would say, uh, okay, uh, these are the feeding, uh, are you participating in, in any supplemental food programs? Uh, the other thing, I think, and this is relevant in the local level, meron bang local government spending on social protection? Uh, and that would be also interesting to see because it did also input into whether <laughs> decentralization is good because uh, it might be that the local governments are more specializing on social protection rather than uh, well, that's just a hypothesis. I don't know whether that is born by the data, but it would be interesting. Uh, okay, Miss, so that's just my comment. And uh, okay, Miss Cuenca, um, I, I found the talk uh, interesting, but we kind of know that. The thing is, the reality now is that uh, the local government is there, the local government code is there, and I think politically, it, as you also mentioned, it's really hard. To <laughs> to make it bawe and even meron pangang move to decentralized uh, more. So and I think you also mentioned it, but it would be interesting. As a, uh, I'm not sure whether there have been studies, but for different social services or different services, I think the technology also affects what is the level, the optimal level. Uh, like, and this is also related to health. Uh, I'm, I'm actually happy that Dr. Abrigo just used antenatal care, which is primary health. You would think that a municipality, a rural health unit, would be able to provide that. It's not rocket science. Uh, and yet, you see, you see externalities, you see spillovers, you see that, you know, it doesn't seem like the municipality is the optimal level of provision, no? Uh, so parang, that's good evidence, I think, for, you know. Uh, but I think the point I would like to make is that technology is changing. Uh, for instance, in maternal health, before you said, okay, we can just have, uh, you know, uh, skilled skilled birth attendant. Ngayon hindi na gusto na nila facility based, right? And therefore, uh, the the optimal what do you call this level of service delivery at what level is is really changing. So, parang I would like to have your. Uh, well, dito kasi dun sa decentralization uh, in particular, uh, parang it's a done deal. We can't do anything about it. There's a local government code. What are the recourses that we can suggest given that kind of structure? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma Dr. Sikat. Thank you for the comments, Dr. Kraft. It's nice to see you. Um, with regard to the programs that we included, thank you. Um, also, regard suggesting PAGCOR and PCSO. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is an update of a paper that I did for World Bank back in 2013. And it was the Social Economic Development Committee of NEDA that had identified the programs to be included. Per but perhaps if I decide to, yeah, I can explore more, including PAGCOR and uh, PCSO. And noted also, that's a very interesting suggestion to see the per capita, uh, per beneficiary expenditures, social protection. With regards to um, social spending uh, for local governments, um, in the decentralization paper, um, we found there, there was one, there was evidence that uh, voters prefer social welfare expenditures from provincial governments. Uh, yeah, from provincial governments among all of the different classes of expenditures. But this is just for uh, the years 2000 and 2003. Uh, that was when the study was done. So, 
So, but also noted um, to look at it as well in the big picture. So, thank you. Okay. Dr. Abrigo, your thoughts, please. Uh, hi, Mamalali. Uh, thank you for your comments. Um, ano nga yung sabihin ko? <laughs> well, marami kasing, marami kasing uh, ano, uh, umiikot. But, but, but I, I agree with you that technology is changing and actually um, even yung um, arguments for decentralization is medyo weak na because we, the argument for, our, for decentralization is that the, the central government has no information do sa, do sa decisions ng, local, ng, ng people and now there's a lot of information, uh, billions of data and I think uh, we're just starting to leverage on that data. And, and again, on the one extreme, the, the we would want to have some form of centralization. But then the, rea the reality is that we have local government code. And the other rea reality is that we have UHC. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm happy with the current UHC, is because it's trying to, ano ba, ano ba yung tawag nila? it's trying to build Humpty Dumpty together again. Parang ganon. <laughs> Well, it's, it's broken because of the, centra the centralization, and, and now we're trying to build it back at the provincial level. At least uh, there's some effort. Uh, well, there has been a lot of efforts before, yung PIP, yung interlocal health zones, and now we have this, and hopefully, well, hopefully, it, it will be more permanent uh, than the last one. Um, I guess, uh, more and more, I guess we would see more uh, greater catchment. The, 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 the question still is, uh, will we be able to sustain this uh, provincial uh, provincial uh, thing? Kasi dati hindi siya nag-work. Baka ngayon pag may pera na, kasi dati wala namang pera eh. Ano parang binagsak lang tapos after yun wala na ulit. Pero ngayon na mas permanent yung flow of cash, maybe uh, there's a lot, there's more incentive na mag, mag ano sila. But then having said that, hindi lang kasi itong provision yung problema natin. There's also the, the, the question about financing. So, ibang kwentuhan yun na, well, last year lang ang dami nating libre pinapamigay. Well, well, it's not bad because for equity reasons, but then, well, tumatanda yung Pilipinas, mas magiging mas mahal lang mas mahal. I guess it's time for people to internalize the costs of their actions. So, part of that would be the uh, greater syntaxes, and part of that may be... Uh, less reliance on uh, unfunded pe uh, unfunded pension and uh, social health insurance but more on on savings to finance health i guess there are a lot of options marami lang talagang kwentuhan thank you so much miss cuenca your insights please yung sinabi niya about the uh, technology affecting the optimal level um agree po ako doon pero hindi ko alam kung sa ngayon, hindi ko alam kung paano siya um, aaralin. I mean, anong, although sabi ni Mike kanina, um, using big data, pwede mo naman din nga siyang um, maaral. But um, yung availability po siguro ng data na yun, yung I mean, yung access namin doon sa TEDA na yun. At saka po yung, yung kasi pong study ko talaga is, yung pinresent ko po ngayon is just understanding po the context po ng health devolution sa, sa Pilipinas. Kasi meron po akong mas uh, parang quantitative na papers na ginawa na sa tingin ko po, kailangan kong maintindihan itong health devolution sa Philippine context. Kaya po, inaral ko itong, ito, kumbaga isang chapter lang po itong nung paper. But then, sorry po, hindi ko na nabigyan pansin yung, or attention yung technology na sinasabi po niyo. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Follow-up question? Uh, sorry lang kay Dr. Abrigo. Uh, did you find, ano, uh, what they call this, crowding out of expenditures? Halimbawa, if the, if the city, if you kind of had a city that was artificially made, right? I mean, yun yung city ratification variable mo, di ba? You did not really meet the normal requirements, but by some law, you were, uh, no. and so did you find that, uh, I'm not sure whether it's part of your study, but did you find that there was some crowding out, like the national transfer actually crowding out local government expenditures? Dr. Abrigo? Well, yan yung gusto namin tigdan eventually, actually. Uh, this is part of an ongoing uh, a series of 
uh, research that we're doing here at the institute. Actually, meron ba kaming gustong gawin, which is uh, recentralization. Kasi meron tayong mga hospitals na na-recentralize. Does that actually make them uh, better hospitals? So yung mga ganong kwentuhan. Okay, thank you. Other questions from the audience, please? Dr. Toots? To Albert of PIDS, I just uh, again let me re-echo what Vic has mentioned that uh, the the presentations were really all very insightful, uh, but let me sort of uh, reframe what others were also started start, starting to ask, which is given now the push towards federalism, uh, and am I? Am I understanding the, that all of the authors are sort of saying now that we need to study more what ha really has been the effects of decentralization? Because there hasn't really been a like we, we, we sort of have like snippets of things where <laughs> we're just seeing small parts, but we're not seeing the whole picture. There has ne unlike in other countries where Things have been pushed, and then now they, there has been uh, more evidence to suggest that decentralization has worked in some cases, not worked in some ad, in others. We're just seeing these kinds of things still here too. But until now, now that we we know that there's probably going to be a likely push again <laughs> uh, in the political system for uh, some changes, are we? sort of now trying to ask people to say hey well let's 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 pause for a moment and and, and see whether whether this is worth it uh, because this is a cousin federalism is you are Janet I think you are, those were your words federalism is a cousin so what are because I'm always trying to eventually say what's the bottom line for, especially for our political leaders they're the, they're the decision makers and 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 even if we keep saying that decentralization and slash federalism seems to be a good idea, but because of the way empirically we've 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 had both good and bad, uh, you know, we do need they and they need to be able to say specifically, hey, you know what? Because unfortunately, the our major decision makers will always work for a bottom line. Uh, so will we will we have it or we won't we have it? Will you know? Right now, there's there. I I, I saw in the uh, Facebook posts. Uh, I think the Speaker of the House put giving a whole document to to the to the Senate President saying, "Hey, this is this is what we're pushing for as federalism." So and so yun yun yung nagiging concern ko rin. Are we are 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 all your are all what you're saying now from what you said that let's study it more. Are we also saying to our political leaders, should we pause for a moment? <laughs> Slow down. <laughs> so who would like to answer first? Dr. Sikat, would you like to go first? Uh, as I said earlier, um, there's very, very scant empirical evidence as to, and we're still, I personally, as a researcher and a member of the academe, I'm still trying to understand. I've been studying decentralization since the 90s. So I personally am still trying to understand exactly how to improve it. There have been massive efforts in terms of improving administration and implementing more, uh, enforcing better at the DILG. But I s that's my personal view. Thank you. Ms. Cuenca? Ako personally. Uh, I I <laughs> I suggest po na pag-aralan mo nang mabuti kasi hindi kasi ano eh parang sa tingin ko matuto na tayo sa experience natin sa health devolution. 'Yun lang po. Na kita mo na nga na dahil minadali siya, actually meron pa po akong nakuhang uh, info na medyo political din yung political talaga yung uh, driving f ano, force kaya siya na napasa. So, kasi parang sino po ba ang babagsakan? I mean, sino maapektuhan? 
tayo-tayo rin. So, sana po yun, maghinay-hinay, aralin pong mabuti. Kung ano, kasi parang pagtitingnan po, dahil nga, actually yung federalism, yun yung parang pinaka-umbrella. Yun na yung pinaka-umbrella eh, di ba? Kay, kay Wallace Oates, yun na yung umbrella, yung federalism. Depende lang kung gaano ka decentralized mo gusto siya i-design. Kung tutuusin po sa ngayon, very decentralized po tayo kasi nasa sa municipal level po yung decentralization at actually sa barangay level pa. Pero nung, uh, sorry I have to quote my, my former boss, na nung inaral po nila yung design ng federalism na, na tinutulak sa ngayon, parang mas uh, centralized yung magiging arrangement niya. So, ang sa akin lang po, regardless kung highly decentralized or mm, less decentralized, parang sa akin po siguro i-way po natin kung ano yung cost at saka yung benefits of mm, ano, pushing for federalism. Kasi pag titingnan po, dahil nga nasa sa isang umbrella sila, di ba, kung ano, yung, kung ano yung meron tayo at kung ano yung tinutulak nila, same lang po kasi yung objectives na ma-achieve natin eh. Ang, ang, ang pag-uusapan na lang po dyan ay eh kung willing tayong ga, uh, gastusan kung ano man yung, yung gusto nating uh, itulak. Tapos meron po akong isang nabasa sa, sa literature, isang scholar, sabi niya, yung daw level ng decentralization ay nadidetermine ng, nadidetermine ng kung gaano ka-efficient yung delivery ng service doon sa level of government na yon. So, gusto ko lang pong i-share, meron kasi akong ginagawang study ngayon na tinitingnan ko po yung efficiency of uh, local government uh, uh, health spending. So, parang gusto kong tingnan, naging efficient ba yung delivery ng health services at the province level? So, yung, yung itong inaaral ko po na to, kinonsolidate ko lahat ng LGUs at the province level. So, lahat ng munisipyo at saka cities, uh, pwera po yung mga highly urbanized at saka independent cities, uh, kinonsolidate ko siya at the province level and then uh, titingnan ko siya uh, using stochastic frontier analysis. Meron na po akong mga nakuhang initial findings. Um... Mm, may iba na significant yung, yung, yung findings na ano siya, nag-result siya in inefficiency. So, parang mas lumalaki yung cost mo ng pag-deliver ng service. Pag-i-take i, pag i into account mo yung decentralization indicator po na, na ginamit ko. Pero uh, dahil hindi naman po yun yung focus na... <laughs> Na-share ko lang po na, na yeah, meron, meron namang ginagawang pag-aaral. Kung baga parang uh, naisip ko rin po din talaga na magandang tingnan kung, kung talagang nag-promote siya ng, ng efficiency over, over the years. Thank, Thank you, you Dr. Abrigo. Okay. Sasagot, sasagot lang ako. Okay, sasagot. Uh, I guess uh, let me go back to if, if we want to push for federalism, I guess we, we need to go back to the questions that were raised two years ago in the, annual, the Peace Annual Public Policy Conference, and I'll just cite two of the questions that were raised. One is, a, um, well, these are not my questions, but these were raised during the, the APPC. One is, well, if federalism is the solution, what is the problem? <laughs> and uh, second, what can federalism do that the local government code cannot do? Dr. Pakeyo? I'm not to ask about. I'm not going to ask about any more about federalism. <laughs> Technical question, na lang. Um, is Mike? Um, the way I understood your presentation was that uh, um, the local um, um, income from local sources, when it increased, it has an, an impact controlling for national transfers. A national transfer has an effect if you, uh, but if you introduce the local sources, it, it, the, the effect of the national transfers disappear? Uh, when, when you introduce the interlocal spillovers? Oh. My question really is, um, does 
the national transfer, particularly because it affects uh, investment or expenditures on economic activities, raise the local uh, income. Because if it does, it has an indirect effect. And we want to know that, I think. Uh, so it may not be exactly true, or it may, may be leading to just say it has the transfer, national transfer has no impact if in fact it has an impact through raising the nation, the local income. Um, my other question is to uh, Justine. And uh, maybe I missed it, I fell asleep maybe. Um, but did, did, did uh, I, I did a study a few years ago which basically um, showed that the Philippines uh, before the ramping up of the conditional cash transfers uh, actually was way behind in terms of if you total, in terms of the social protection defined as social assistance plus social insurance. Uh, but when uh, the CCT program was ramped up so that it's, it was already like 50, 60 billion pesos that was spent, we actually um, kind of became, uh, uh, came maybe a little over or close to the, the average. Th this I'm talking about expenditures, social, exp social protection expenditures relative to GDP. So the reason I'm asking this because sometimes, or I just met actually one congressman which uh, thought that we're spending too much on social uh, assistance, social program, particularly CCT, because it's now moving to, to like 85 or 87 uh, billion. And so my, um, what I'm asking is whether in fact uh, you have come to that conclusion that actually we're just catching up and that we are now on the level more or less with international average. So that's, that's my, my question, and, 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 uh, and maybe that's a point that you might want to kind of emphasize. Um, the, other, the other question, a related question, is that, uh, or it's more really a comment, um, is that I think we have to um, be, uh, be more nuanced in our definition of what social protection means. Uh, that is to say, sometimes it, you give the impression that it is all consumption, like welfare. When in fact, a lot, a lot of that, particularly like the CCT types, and even a lot of the health types, are really investment in human capital with returns in the future. So that, you know, we always often hear this assistance of the poor being welfare, tumatatamad sila, or it's not paying off, maybe we should have go negotium, uh, invest natin, when in fact there is a high rate of return to investment in nutrition, in, in, in child health, even from the beginning of his life, uh, and then of course education, where there is a high rate of return. So I think it's maybe kind of make it a little bit more uh, take, take, take into account in the presentation or the communication of these expenditures on social protection that actually a lot of that is social investment that's productive. That's just an Okay, so let's start with Dr. Abrigo to be followed by Dr. Sikat. Well, um, sir, we actually did look at it uh, that way because uh, in, in this model, uh, external, yung once you've con we're, we're controlling for local income. But then if, if that's the argument, we would expect that the, the results would be positive, biased upwards, but then we didn't see anything. So I, I guess uh, wala talagang, walang, walang effect. Um, uh, na lang muna. <laughs> Dr. Sikat. Thank you for that, Dr. Pakeo. And daming tanong. Yeah, but uh, I appreciate your comment regarding 
also highlighting that um, social protection is not just transfers, it's also investment because there are kabuhayan programs. That's why at the beginning of my presentation, I defined all of the programs there or um, uh, training uh, and, uh, to be able to uh, put up a business, their livelihood, um, as well as there's uh, scholarships for indigenous persons um, and all that. And um, so thank you for that. I agree, it should be highlighted. With regard to the f your first question, or are we just catching up or not? Well, um, I only examined, because of the difficulty really in being able to compare across countries, I only looked at existing evidence. And the, the best indicator that I could find was the ADB Social Protection Index. The social safety net, the study of the, the work done that came out last year. Just last year, okay, social safety net. So I'll take a look at that as well, and thank you. So, so that was what I, I found, that was in 2013. And we are not lagging far behind the regional average, as I mentioned earlier, and in fact, we're doing pretty well with respect to labor market uh, intervention. So so can I say definitively that um, we're catching up? Well, the evidence shows, based on 2013, that um, we compare pretty well to the regional average. So so that's all I <laughs> have to say about that. Uh, <laughs> OK, sorry, <laughs> there. So, um, we named a new ones our definition of social protection. Uh, so I already addressed that. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sikat. Questions from the, uh, yes, sir. Hi, Hi I'm Jules from CPBRD, uh, Congressional Policy and Budget Research Department. I'm not here to advocate for federalism. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, I want to ask a question regarding the the point of uh, Dr. Sikat about varied development outcomes. Um, have you tried, ma'am? Um, have you encountered studies really uh, defining what are these varied development outcomes? And uh, my question really is on um, Republic Act 7160 in terms of impact. Um, has uh, RA 7160 really improve development outcomes operationalized in terms of let's say let's use the human development concept like uh, which has essentially three dimensions like decent standard of living health and education and um, in explaining this varied development because I want maybe I want to see in the study which of the provinces really have uh, improved because of uh, RA 7160 because of this is centralization policy which cities which municipalities have really uh, posted uh, negative uh, development outcomes as a result of the implementation of this of this policy and going back to the question of uh, related to federalism um, I guess the, the the point here is that um, I think there's a need to really examine the existing distribution of powers and resources, which is basically a question being exam being addressed by advocates of uh, um, federalism or those people who are also against it. Kailangan kailangan tingnan natin yung yung current distribution ng ng powers uh, and resources ng government. And if I may suggest for um, the w some ways to go about it, like in terms of decentralization, um, we, we really need a, a good operational definition of what we're talking about. Like uh, in certain functions, of, uh, like for health, you, we can basically identify five or six dimensions. Like uh, what are we talking about? Decentralization in terms of policy making, financing, uh, provision, production, regulation. Para po mas enhance yung debate, let's not just be general that we're talking about this. Let's operationalize. And in terms of access, uh, Dr. Lerbigo, I, I want to ask about the your slide showing that uh, there was one slide you, where you showed that there was increasing access to antenatal services from 19... Uh, is that an evidence of... Do you think, don't you think that's an evidence that... Uh, 
decentralization has contributed to enhance access. Um, and uh, in terms of access, I, I'm fond of uh, operational definition. Um, may I also um, um, may I also suggest that uh, we, we try to look at access in terms of four dimensions. Like one is in terms of geographic accessibility of the service or facility, the availability of the service, the quality and the affordability of the service. Has decentralization enhanced access of our citizens in terms of geographic accessibility of services, the availability of the services that they need, the affordability. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. So we start with uh, Dr. Sika, the impact of uh, the local government code of 1991. So thank you for the questions, Jules. You're, you were, you're with June, right? Yes. Yeah, you're with June together. So the first one, with regards to varied LGU development outcomes, um, as I summarized earlier, it's very, very scant. Uh, there's some uh, sluggish progress in Human Development Index that was back in 2007, Kapuna, um, and then World Bank again in 2011. But, but your more interesting question, which is also s something that I'm interested to do, however, as Mike also mentioned earlier, is such really, it's so difficult to be able to say definitively in any impact assessment if it's decentralization that had contributed to, to to the progress or the regress of development outcomes. But, but I think the way to go is really to just break down the questions into simple ones that we can answer little by little, which is what's being done in the literature. But, but I absolutely agree that um, how it would be nice if we could do an overall impact assessment and say for sure that this is what the local government code really contributed or not. But we can still pursue that. Uh, you do research also at uh, CB, yeah. So thank you, f thank you for that. Dr. Abrigo? Well, the quick and dirty answer is, well, not really because, well, 1993, 2017, hindi lang po decentralization kasi yung nagbago between 1993 and 2017. And we know with in the past 25 years, yung income natin tumaas, uh, education levels have increased. So marami pong nagbago. And I, I agreed sa sinasabi ni Dr. Sikat na, W what we mean by impact is that kaya natin i-attribute yung causal effect to decentralization and that is difficult I in our case kasi nga Big Bang, well, for, the, for, for many reasons. And that was what we were trying to do in this paper is that we try to break down the question into smaller bite-sized pieces na we're not looking at the decentralization as a whole but what if we just look at income and what does that mean for access? Thank you. Uh, Ms. Cuenca, would you like to share something? So, uh, questions from the audience, please. Anybody? Hello? Are we still here? <laughs> yes, doc, uh, Mr. Agustin. Just a challenge to PIDs. Uh, I like PIDs because you're a think tank. Eh? But I think it does not reach the barangay level. So <laughs> kindly reach your studies down to the barangay level. So that, oh, iba yung ano eh, knowledge eh. Thank you. That is well noted, sir. <laughs> Madam President. <laughs> yes. Oh, yes, OK. Okay, uh, questions from the audience, please. Or would you like, instead of, yeah, yes, sir. Dr. Balaong po from the Doctors to the Bars program. So, um, <laughs> good afternoon. Um, kasi po yung pinag-usapan natin decentralization and devolved nga po yung health services. Now, have you come across with studies on the Bangsamoro ARMM and the yung health outcomes po dun sa ARMM compared to the other regions? Who would like to answer that? Okay, Ms. Cuenca. Uh, sorry. Sorry dun sa ginagawa kong study, hindi ko sinama yung ARM. Kasi unang-una, iba yung structure ng ARM. Kasi di ba, meron silang organic act na organic act of uh, arm, di ba? 
in nine, of 1994. So, tapos meron din silang local government code. So, actually, medyo nagkakabanga yung, yung dalawang batas na yun. So, pag favorable dun sa... <laughs> yung ganun eh. So, kaya hindi ko siya sinama. Ang hirap, ang hirap siyang ihalo doon sa mga ibang probinsya kasi iba yung structure niya. So, hindi ko alam kung merong dito na may ginagawang study na talagang ang focus lang is on, on arm. Oo oh, oh po. Parang kahit siguro hindi mo gawan ng ano naman, ng analysis naman or kung ano mang econometrics. Alam mo naman na talaga, I mean, just looking at the numbers, iwan talaga po yung ano, yung arm. Okay. Uh, I guess, uh, ang interesting na question is, uh, whether with ARMM, after ARMM, naging better ba sila? So, so I guess that's the, that's the question rather than. So would you like to answer your own question, sir? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, Thank you for actually, sharing. Actually, sir, yun po yung medyo tanong ko rin sa isip ko kasi kung kasi pagtitingnan mo yung GAA, may separate na budget talaga for arm, for health, for, di ba po? Tapos, pero they also access funds from the local government ko, di ba po? Yung IRA. Nakareceive din po sila ng IRA. So, opo. Oo nga po, pero dahil po ang gumagasta ay yung regional government po ninyo. Sorry, I have to ask this question. Saan po ginagasta yung ira na nakukuha ng local governments? Ng province, ng munisipyo? Eh, kasi di ba po kung ginagastos sana ng regional government po yung delivery ng services and then nakakakuha ng ira yung local governments doon. So, paano po ba? Kinukombine ba nila yung resources? Kaya, kaya, po, kaya din po medyo nahirapan po akong ihalo siya sa mga ibang probinsya kasi ibang-iba po yung structure niya. Okay. Thank you. Questions? Are we satisfied with the answers of our speakers? Okay. Yes, sir. Pahabol si sir. Ayan. Good afternoon. I'm Paul Casillan of United Nations Development Program. Okay. And first, congratulations to the uh, speakers. Very informative. Um, I just would like to ask uh, personally, um, did you ever encounter in your study 
wherein decentralize decentralization empowers the youth or maybe how uh, the fourth in that i mean the current uh, um the current the fourth industrial revolution that we have that we're experiencing right now like the presence of blockchain facebook and all these things do you think does it have any advantage or impact on decentralization thank you who, who would like to answer the question dr Sikat? yeah to understand your question so the first one, I have not yet encountered any studies looking at the impact of decentralization on the youth, but that's just me. Uh, I don't know if anybody else might have uh, youth. Although in the local government code, they should have a seat, right, in the local development council, one of the councils. They, they could possibly have, they should have representation, but that's... that's, that's uh, uh, Wala akong na-encounter na ganun. Pero in theory, di ba, yung decentralization should um, um, foster participation, di ba? So hindi lang siya dapat naka-focus lang sa youth, kundi yung participation talaga ng, ng mga mamamayan dun sa, sa lugar. Pero yung tanong mo, uh, sorry po, wala po. Dr. Abrigo? about his question on will new technology affect decentralization yes well, definitely so sabi ko kanina the, the the premise of decentralization is that uh, the local the central government has legal information on the local uh, on the people and now that we have more information a lot of information maybe uh, there might be room for more centralized uh, involvement sa mga services but then the question is uh, yung attention ba ng national government do they have that attention? Uh, they would look at all these places. So, parang volleying between decentralized and centralized. But there's an additional uh, factor, which is that each locality, particularly the, where a nation was many tribes, have its own preferences and its own interests, and they are competing for limited resources. So, if you have a national government which is controlled by what in the now one's called Thank you so much, Dr. Pakeo. So that's our last question, and that concludes our activity this afternoon. Thank you to the participation of our uh, participants, and of course, to the insightful ideas of our uh, speakers. But before we let you go, may we request our uh, participants to please fill up the information, uh, rather the evaluation sheet given to you earlier. Thank you so much and see you in our future activities. By the way, the PowerPoint presentations uh, will be posted on our website, so please uh, do visit our website. Thank you.